Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are on a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grilling JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Jim, how are you, man? I'm good, Connie. Good, good to see your face and to talk to you. Uh, interesting show today, I think. One of my favorite pay-per-views of all time, WrestleMania 17. We get so much feedback on 17, and uh, people have been, I think, anxiously awaiting this show. I hope we, we're not going to let them down, but it's a, it was really a, a memorable moment to say the least. And, and, uh, if it's not the best top start to finish, uh, WrestleMania, it's in the conversation without question. Well, what else is in the conversation this week is, uh, your girls, Britt Baker and Thunder Rosa, boy, they tore it up and people are still talking about it a week later, aren't they? Yeah, man, they are. It's, uh, I was really, uh, impressed with those two women, how hard they worked. Uh, and, uh, the effort they put forth. And I thought there might be more feet, uh, pushback because of the graphic nature of their match, but I haven't heard that much about that. Nope. Me neither. Which, which is good. It's, yeah. it's, it's good. I mean, people are making less about that than they are about the 10 seconds of pyro that didn't ignite, uh, at revolution, which came a big deal for whatever reason. Uh, it's just hard to judge a pay-per-view. That's a three hour change pay-per-view on 10 seconds. Right. I agree. So I, I think, but that's, as we were talking about, uh, before we started recording, it's just the nature of Twitter and things of that nature. Right now, people just look for negative things to talk about. And, uh, it's, I love Twitter. I have fun on it. I, I enjoy it, but boy, sometimes it gets arduous because people are just so damn negative. And who wants to read negative stuff over and over again? My suggestion is, look, if you can't say something good about something, just ignore it. Move on. Yeah. Time to log off. Yeah, it really is. It's time to log off, buddy. So yeah, that was good. Britt and, uh, Thunder Rosa, uh, uh they raised the stakes. Yes, sir. And, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how, what effect that that match has on the other women in AEW and elsewhere. Yeah. Quite frankly. Uh, on, uh, uh, going forward, I mean, they, they, uh, they did some, they did a historic thing there and, uh, to headline the show, to main event, the show, to deliver what they delivered. And, you know, that was a show that we did and uh, that show was voiced over on the preceding Thursday. So it was the interesting, uh, interesting show. Somebody got on my ass because during the show, <coughs> during a commercial break, I think it was, I tweeted something, you know innocuous, but it was, I tweeted something and somebody said, you should get your mind on the show and not be tweeting during it. Oh my God. So I, you do know it's taped. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you want? What do you want? You know? Oh so my God. anyway, it's, uh, <laughs> it's great. And also, you know, I got some feedback this week, not a lot, 
but some feedback from fans of Andrade because they felt like I dissed him. How? How'd you diss him? I don't know. I, don't, I really don't know. He's a great hand. He's a very talented guy. All I said was, if you're going to give your notice, you hope you thought it through. Right. I don't, I don't know how long his contract lasts. Uh, normally when you go public on a, asking for a release, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, sit well. Those are things you just keep to yourself and the, and the management. So, uh, but I never inferred that he was not a, a very talented guy. He is a very talented guy. No, you never said that. Hey, but he's not, he's so, not being used. Right. And, and you know, you can identify with that. I mean, once upon a time you were under Vince's employee and he wasn't using you, but he was paying you. And I know on the one hand, you're like, okay, I got in the business to make money. But on the other hand, you kind of want to work, right? Yeah. Yeah. You want to apply your trade, everything you prepared for, you want to be utilized for it. So, but hopefully he'll, all that will work out. You know, here's the thing. They have so many, they're so deep with this bodies. Yeah. And I would, I, I know that's got to be a tough decision, uh, to make to who, who gets used, who doesn't and all those things. So, but I, I certainly meant no uh, disrespect to him whatsoever. And some of his fan base were took exception that I guess I mentioned him in that light that, you know, I didn't say he's the greatest wrestler of all time. I, I didn't follow his career in triple a in those places. Did you, I saw some of his stuff over in new Japan and, uh, I, I would challenge anybody who isn't familiar with his stuff. Go check out La Sombra. Uh, that was his, uh, his name prior to coming to WWE. Very, very, very great performer. But if you weren't re really keeping up with international wrestling, whether it was in Mexico or Japan, I could see how he wouldn't be on your radar. And, you know, Jim, you usually keep up with all the big stuff happening here in America, but there's a lot of wrestling happening on happening worldwide that it's hard to keep up with all of it. Yeah, it is. It really is. And, uh, you know, I, it, it shows that the, our podcast is, uh, sort of clickbait for a lot of websites. Oh yeah. I enjoy how they interpret what I say. Here's what he really meant. Conrad, <laughs> here's what he really meant. Uh, but you know, as we were talking earlier today, you know, as we looked at it this morning, or I looked at it this morning, brought to your attention, you know, girl and JR is the number one wrestling podcast in the world right now. Congratulations. Yeah. Great to you too, man. It's all, you know, we're team, uh, you're the booker. I just, <laughs> I just, I just go out and do my work. Uh, but I, I appreciate that. And the irony of that is, is that I think did we say six out of the top 12. Yeah. Are, are yours at free shows.com has uh, six out of the top 12 podcasts in the land. Beautiful. That's a great accomplishment for your business. Hey, uh, I was going to ask you about something along those lines. Uh, when is the, I'm getting some good feedback when we tease the, that, that shoot we did when you, when you guys are here, Eric, Tony, you and I, <laughs> when is, when is that going to be available to our wonderful audience. We're going to try to push it out just before WrestleMania. So stay tuned. It's going to be uh, happening over at adfreeshows.com. It's over an hour of, uh, sort of the old legends round table concept. Yeah. That's what so, it felt like. Yeah. But you've got, you got everybody, uh, comfortable and loose and here come the real stories. Our topic is just talking about working for Turner and that whole experience. Oh, and later this week, we're actually going to drop some alternate commentary from WrestleMania three, where you and your old pal, Tony Schiavone sort of revoiced the macho man, Randy Savage, Ricky, the dragon steamboat intercontinental title match. It's been a while since you've done something like that called an old match on tape. Uh, I know that, uh, once upon a time you did that for, I think a bunch of old UWF or mid South matches for the WWE, but was that fun or a little bit like a fish out of water since it wasn't live? Uh, well, it was different. I enjoyed it. I think Tony did as well. We did it from the comfort of my, my couch. The difference is that when you're doing play by play, you want a headset like this. You want to be able to hear yourself, hear your partner, blah, blah, blah. We didn't have that luxury on that day. Uh, so it became more of a narrative, but we did some play by play without doubt. Uh, but it was fun, you know, and going back and watching those matches, we did three, we did, uh, undertaker and, and, and Lesnar, and we did, uh, the ladder match from WrestleMania 10 with Michaels and razor. 
So, uh, and it's just interesting to see how the, how times evolve and change and styles evolve and psychologies evolve and things of that nature. I mean, the match, the latter match was really ahead of its time, but it's amazing to see how far it's the latter matches have come since that one at WrestleMania 10, right? It's, it's changed. There's been, they've added more to that game. So it was, uh, it was fun. So I'm, I'm looking, oh, folks will check it out. I think they'll find it fun. If nothing else, our take on those matches and, and, uh, and Tony and I always have fun working together. So it was, it was good stuff. I'm looking forward to it and the stuff with Eric and, uh, and by the way, congratulations to Eric for his hall of fame induction that she's for the Sears class. Who else is in that class? Do you know? Molly, Molly has been announced. And I, I assume they're announcing another one this week as you and I are putting this episode in the can a few days early, but I'm sure by the time everyone hears this, they know the third member, but the first of this class 2021 was Molly Holly. Eric Bischoff was second. And I guess just any day now we'll, we'll know the third one. Yeah, it's good. Well, I hope it's, uh, it's going to make somebody happy. It's a great accomplishment in my view. <laughs> you know, I, I still wear, I wear my hall of fame ring all the time. Yeah. I'm proud of, I'm proud of being a part of that group. 2007 was the year that I went in with Lawler and I had a pretty good presenter that day and stone cold. He yeah, I said, do. yeah, it was not bad. Uh, and we started off the show that night. Uh, and I, I was excited about that opportunity. It's kind of the same philosophy of kicking off a pay-per-view. You, know, you kind of want to set the tone. Yep. I remember Steve saying, uh, I'd love to do it, but I'm not going to write no speech. Okay. Say what you want to say. Right. I'm going to tell stone cold how to do a promo. No. So it was, you know, whatever he's going to say is what he's going to say. And I was just happy to be there and happy that he was willing to, uh, you know, champion my cause, so to speak. So but it'll be fun. And I know there are going to be some, uh, there's always because of COVID and social distancing and all those things, uh, I would assume that the hall of fame induction ceremony is going to be, have a little different look, but, uh, don't know all the details, but it'll be on Peacock network. I gotta, I gotta figure that, that out. To be honest with you, I gotta figure out, uh, how to, it shouldn't be hard for me to even me to learn how to subscribe to the Peacock network. It's not expensive. Is it? No, it's not. It's uh it's really affordable and you get access to everything else. I already am a subscriber to Peacock. Uh, we have all the little streaming apps on an Apple TV that we travel with. So I already had it, but I haven't played with it yet from the WWE side of things. So we'll see, but it is something that everybody's talking about this week, just like they were 20 years ago. And they were talking about WrestleMania 17. Does it feel like that was 20 years ago? This feels like it was like 10 years ago to me. Yeah, it does. We, that's one of the amazing things about doing these shows and going back in time is that you always say it's, it's been that long, right? Wow. So, Hey, I'm just glad to be alive after these 20 years and that we can still talk about it, but it was a hell of a memory and a, and a great opportunity for all of us to do our best work. Uh, and the card was great. The atmosphere was as good as you get. Uh, you know, I grew up in Oklahoma and we had, uh, the two network affiliates, uh, the NBC affiliate covered, uh, the American football conference, which our, our home team was the Houston Astro Houston Astros, the Houston uh, Oilers. Love you blue Earl Campbell, bum Phillips, all those cats. And, uh, so that was what I grew up watching with my dad. You know, we watched a lot of football every, every Sunday. So if he, we didn't have direct TV, we had, we had an antenna. Yeah. And so on our antenna, uh, we would watch uh, the CBS station carried at that time, carried the NSC, which was the Cowboys in my neighborhood. And then, uh, the other one was, I mentioned was the Houston Oilers. So going to the Astrodome for me was a real cool memory. Yeah. It reminded me of my dad, it, you know, things like that. I, I get, I get sentimental. Uh, you know, I'm thinking, you know, dad said one time, I said, we we're watching a game and he said, God damn, son, that building would hold a lot of hay. <laughs> So yeah, dad, it would. So I was, I thought of that when we, were, when we went out, got introduced Heyman and I, and I'm thinking, yeah, dad, this building will hold a lot of hay. That's fun. But it's pretty cool to see all the people there. And, you know, I don't know. I just, the, the, the largesse of it really came through to me. 
and uh, finally in, in that building on that field, it was pretty cool. And to set the record for the largest crowd ever for any event in the Astrodome was pretty incredible. When you think of all the great events they've had there, you know, George Strait concerts, you know, all kinds of things, football games, obviously, <laughs> but, but the concerts and stuff were legendary. Yeah. And we, and we beat the record. So I thought that was pretty cool. So it'll be a fun show to talk about without, without a doubt. So, but I did want to say congratulations to Eric. 83 weeks is always is doing good. You know, I'm proud to be on the team and I'm proud he's on our team together. And I do think when people see this uh, little piece of business that we recorded with uh, all the guys, the first thing they're going to say, Conrad, well, if Conrad got all those guys drunk. They just went crazy. <laughs> I will tell you in all transparency, <laughs> we were all drinking. Uh, none of us were drinking and driving. None of us got sloppy drunk. We got giggly drunk. We just had fun. So, uh, it was like guys, it's almost like going to happy hour. We, we got us a nice table. Here we are and, and, and hit record and see what, and see what happens. That's real. <clears throat> Yeah, so it's how it worked and it was really a fun deal. So a lot of big things coming up for, uh, all of us on the ad free network and folks, if you haven't gotten it, I, I sure encourage you to get it. I, I, I watched, uh, I watched the second part of the Jimmy Crockett interview, which I loved. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. You did a great job. It's just amazing that he has such, he had such little awareness of how, how big a contributor to our profession that he was totally agree. You know, he just, he deserved, you know, he deserved a, an attaboy more than once. So, but I thought he was extremely honest and answered a lot of questions. And I love the fact, you know, he, he had to go to do all over again. There's things he would have changed, but hell, we can all say that about our lives to some degree. Sure. You know, things would change. So a lot of good things going on in wrestling. I'm glad to be a part of it. I'm glad to be a part of the show today. I am too, man. WrestleMania 17, one of our most requested topics, and it's easy to see why. It's a sellout crowd here, 67,925 fans. They paid a gross of over $3.5 million. It did a 2.08 buy rate, which is around 900,000 buys. It's an all-time record for a wrestling pay-per-view. That's going to gross the company $13.31 million. And, uh, the actual live gate, which is $3,530,905 is the largest for a pro wrestling event outside of Japan and more than doubled the previous American record set way back at WrestleMania five for that historic Hogan, Randy Savage match. The, uh, the crowd 67,925 fans is going to be the seventh largest crowd up to that point. This is a, a big deal, you know, a, a huge, by any metric, it is a huge success, but there's so much happening with wrestling in, in this, uh, I guess, 10 day period. Heyman's here because ECW's folded. Uh, and of course we know that WCW went out of business just six days prior to this, you know, Vince took over nitro and now you guys are the only shooting match in town and you've got two super white hot stars in the rock and stone cold, Steve Austin. I mean, would you guys have ever been able to forecast this type of success or is it one of those things where the momentum gets going and before you know it, you're just accidentally there. Well, you know, rock and Austin are magic, no matter where, when, or how, uh, and that was their second match of their trilogy. They had, you know, they were, they headlined WrestleMania 15, 17 and 19. Yep. Uh, those three dudes or those two dudes. And, uh, so we knew it was going to be a special match, especially considering that was going to be the match where Austin really declared himself as a heel. Uh, I can tell you that for me in my role as a talent head of talent relations, that was probably the one of the most busiest and tumultuous times of my career because of the new influx of talent buying WCW, the new talents are coming in. What are we going to do with everybody? Uh, it was really uh, daunting. It was one of those 24 or seven deals for a while. And, uh, that's the only, the re that's the only regret I have. You know, I'd like to be able just to go to, to Houston and that's one thing on my mind. And that's calling the matches at WrestleMania 17. But, uh, 
I had a lot of other th things on my plate that had to be addressed that couldn't be pushed aside very timely and, uh, delicate issues, negotiating contracts, <clears throat> you know, talent want to know what they're, what you're going to do with them. You know, uh, the only thing I could help them with is here's what you're going to make. So it was, uh, I wish we had had a little bit clearer path from my perspective, because there's a lot of stuff on my mind and other people's minds as well. But through all that stuff, we, we came up with a, a, a hell of a show. And I, the, the one thing that was exciting about it, Conrad, was the fact that we're going to go to the dome for the first time since 92. So, uh, it had been a long time. So that was a new adventure to, to do a dome show and then it just go crazy. We could have sold a lot more tickets if we had room. It was just, it was a legit sellout and one of the hottest tickets I've ever been around as far as pro wrestling was concerned. No doubt about it. I mean, just the hype surrounding this and, and the media and I don't know, it just feels like this is when the product was at its hottest and fanfare for the company was at its biggest. Uh, this might be, you know, people always talk about when was it at its peak? Is this the peak of, of WWE's run? Do you think, I mean, it feels like from here, it starts to go, you know, in a different direction. I'm not going to say necessarily downhill, but. It doesn't feel like it ever got captured the imagination and the dollars as well as it did here at WrestleMania 17. Well, the captivating part, I think was uh, rock and Austin. Right. Uh, and two once in a lifetime talents that were on this great story that they were on and telling a story and it, you know, uh, it'd been, uh, I don't know. It just, it, it just was, I thought amazing. Now, Austin. Now, he didn't work with rocket 15. Did he? Um, yeah, he, he did. He did 15, 17. Oh yeah. Yeah. I said 15, 17 and 19. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'm thinking about, uh, WrestleMania the, 2000. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, uh, it was, it was really fun, but it might be, it might've been the peak. If it wasn't, it was, we could see the peak and it's just hard to, uh, to get more talents over to the level that Austin and rock were over. So, uh, I think, uh, I think you're onto something. It was somewhere there. And, and I, here, I guess the, the, I guess it's hard to debate. It was the peak because we did 19 after two years after that with the same match. And, uh, if that would be today on, on, uh, social media, people would be bitching about it because I've already seen that. I've already seen that match. So you're gonna make me pay for it again. Yep. And they did and they loved it. And it was Austin's last match. <clears throat> the missed opportunity there was nobody knew it was going to be Austin's last match. I I've always said that if we had promoted it as such, that it would have even had bigger buy rates. Cause this is, this is it for stone cold win, lose or draw. He's gone, but he didn't want to go that route. He didn't want that to be a part of the show. And so we respected his wishes and, and we, uh, never mentioned it, but I do think that was a missed opportunity from a marketing standpoint, right? You know, to see stone cold for the last time. So then all of a sudden we had the match, we have, uh, you know, barely get it in the ring, so to speak. We couldn't put it on last cause he we weren't sure of Steve's health, uh, and close with the lesser and angle, uh, which is a, which is great. Uh, but I, I, I think, uh, I think Steve and, and rock just delivered like an amazing, which we'll talk about here momentarily, but, uh, it was a cool show. It was a cool show. I think the dome thing it, to be in a dome was a real cool thing for a wrestling announcer. Oh, you know, yeah. hell, I, me, me calling matches in the Irish Neil boys club in Shreveport before 50 or hundred people, you know, this is a long way from there, boy. This was a long way from there. This is the closest thing we ever got to something like that was a, a couple of super dome shows for cowboy that actually did real well. Uh, so I, I, I look back at the, this event with a lot of fondness, quite frankly. Well, there's a lot of stuff to, to really be excited about. <coughs> I guess we should just briefly touch on the fact that, you know, we mentioned it a moment ago, the Monday night wars are over. So this is the first WrestleMania in years where there haven't been Monday night wars, so to speak, WCW's done. You guys purchased them. On this particular show, we do see a cutaway of some WCW guys in a box there watching the event. Do, as far as you remember, did you guys have 
a real plan for what you were going to do with this WCW asset, or were you so focused on? Because I think we need to put this time in context. ECW is going down. You just purchased WCW. We're about to have the biggest WrestleMania ever. And oh, by the way, there's this thing called the XFL. We're just starting. There's a lot of moving parts in the company on WrestleMania week. There's probably not much time or effort or energy to talk about WCW because you've got to cater to this monster event, right? Yeah. And we just knew that it was an opportunity to, to expose those talents, uh, give them some face time, give them some awareness. Uh, I, I can look at, I can close my eyes and look and see Booker T in that suite, for example. Right. It was a, it was an opportunity to get these new guys in WCW, uh, some positive exposure. And, uh, but past that, I don't know that we were that deep in the planning because as you said, uh, we're, uh Vince is trying to launch the XFL. Yeah. That's going to affect some of us. Uh, WrestleMania itself is a monster to promote and produce. And then you have the WCW buyout, as you said, the Monday night wars are now history. It was probably the most tumultuous and stressful time of my professional life, simply because there's so many major projects that were being launched or cultivated. Let's, uh, let's talk about ECW for a minute. It's officially going to close three days after this pay-per-view, but we all know it's closed because. On March 5th, Paul Heyman joined you on commentary on Monday night raw. So he's going to be doing commentary here with you at WrestleMania 17. And I know most people prefer what they grew up with. And for a lot of our listeners, that's Jerry, the King Lawler and good old Jr. But I actually liked you guys as a duo, you and Paul Heyman. It felt like there was a real true blue friendship with you and Jerry but it did feel like it could be contentious at times doing commentary with Paul Heyman. And for whatever reason, I thought that added to the broadcast. what do you think? Yeah, I, it was a different presentation. You know, uh, Jerry was, uh, you know, at that point in time, we'd been together so long that the angst, the, the, the dynamic between the heel and the baby face announcer uh, was kind of passe, not passe in a sense that that concept didn't work anymore because it worked with Heyman and I. But it, it, the Lawler uh, dynamic had changed over the years. And then, uh, you know, when uh, uh, Stacy Carter got let go and Lawler left in somewhat of a protest, uh, you know, the, the, to me, Heyman was the logical successor. I'd worked with Paul in WCW, I'd, uh, you know, uh, and I'd helped him get his first real TV gig on national television because the booking committee didn't want to work with him. Uh, he is a pain in the ass to them. And sometimes he's a pain in the ass to me, but he was so talented that, uh, he knew, he knew how to, he knew his role and, uh, and did a good job. So uh, I enjoyed working with Paul and I see it all the time on the social media that, uh, you know, that Paul Heyman and myself are their favorite team. We weren't together that long, but if we'd have been together longer, I think that would, that might have stood the test of time. Yeah. But I truly enjoyed working with him. He's just so damn smart and it, and he gets it He knew what the hell he was doing. And, uh, he was a, a, a really good antagonist because sometimes the best antagonist Conrad are the villains that say things that, you know, are true, but you just don't want to hear them. And Heyman had the ability to tell the, his version anyway, of the truth and plausible, plausible, uh, and you know, he just wasn't a, a heel getting himself over. He got talent over and he did a great job. So, and, and obviously he's still doing a great job as a mouthpiece of Roman reigns and, and so forth. So, uh, but it was a good experience. Uh, I think we we're both af- a little bit apprehensive going into that show. We, we knew we had to deliver. It wasn't, well, we'll be okay. We'll get through it. That's bullshit, man. I don't want to get through something. I want to make it good. So we, we got through it. All right, obviously, but, uh, I thought it was better than just getting through it. We did a good job that day. He did a real good job. I'm proud to have worked with him. Talk to me about how Paul Heyman came into the company briefly. Is this something that you would have had a conversation with about, or would you have, I mean, would he have just reached out directly to Vince and, and they work out something? Oh gosh. He, I'm sure he being the smart guy that he is, he kept his pipeline to Vince open. Right. Uh, 
you, you go to the decision maker, you want to maintain communication with your, with a decision maker in any environment that you're working in, whether it be wrestling or something else. Uh, you don't want to piss off the decision maker. You want to ingratiate yourself to them. So I'm sure that Paul went through Vince about coming in. Uh, Vince did talk to me about now that Jerry's gone, what do you want? What would you like to do? And, uh, so I said to me, the logical choice to deviate from where we were to give us a, a completely different coat of paint would be to have Heyman work with me because he's going to be a heel. He's going to be caustic and uh, he's smart and he really was motivated to do a great job. You know, Heyman, like any other great performer has an ego and you don't want to go on television and, and fail or be less than you should be. So, uh, I, I knew that it would be a different dynamic. And I think Vince was intrigued by that. And I don't want to say that WrestleMania 17 was a dry run, uh, but it was a, a new voyage. How are the seas going to be that are the seas going to be rough? Or as George Cassandra would say, the seas are angry that day. My friend It's like an old man sending back food at a, at a deli soup at a deli. So that's kind of the deal. I, I think, but I, I enjoyed the, I had no regrets at all. Work with Paul Heyman anytime, any place he did. He did just did a great job. And, uh, and we were both fired up for that show. We were, we were jacked up, ready to rock and roll. Let's talk briefly about uh, something else before we jump into the show or the news and notes around the company. Vince McMahon, uh, two weeks prior to this WrestleMania appeared on the Bob Costas show on the record on HBO mm-hmm. and boy, it did not go well. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you remember about Costas's interaction with Vince here and just how the company was going to, I don't know, try to do damage control because this is not exactly a, a highlight real interview for Vince. And it, it's going to be something a lot of people are covering in the mainstream media. I don't know if it helped us at all at the end of the day. I mean, the opportunity to get on Costas show, which has had a significant audience as well established, uh, got a lot of push. Costas got his push, uh, seemed like a good idea at the time. Right. But how do you, how would you know that Costas is going to really dig deep as a, uh, uh, you know, antagonist and how Vince is going to react at that particular strategy. I don't know that it did us any favors, uh, but except for it showed the other side of Vince McMahon. I thought he was Mr. McMahon more often, than not in that interview. So as far as building a heel and, uh, showing that other side of the chairman and the owner and the, uh, the head on show might not have been a bad thing. Right. If, that, if there's anything that came out of it, good, it might've been that. It, is this, do you think this is one of those moments where everybody within the company says, you know, maybe we don't need to have Vince put in this spot ever again. I don't think so. Cause you couldn't prevent it. Uh, he's going to do what he wants to do. And quite frankly, he was the guy that everybody wanted to talk to. Sure. So you get the best guess you can. And you know, a guy that's been a third generation guy in a business, a guy that's been quietly sitting behind the microphone as a, as a broadcaster. Now, all of a sudden he's one of the league characters. I've always said, and I really believe this and I mean it. This man was the best heel in the attitude era, right? Without a doubt in my mind. And, and the reason is great heels can be measured by the baby faces that they positively affect either by getting them over in the ring, by interacting with them on television and in, in any, any capacity. And, and the bottom line of that is the bottom line is that stone cold got made through a lot of his efforts and interactions with this man. So to say McMahon wasn't effective in his role would be ridiculous, quite frankly. And then, you know, he became the Mr. McMahon that, uh, people still talk about and rightfully so he's that good. Let's move on. Let's talk about, um, there's a situation with Lawler brewing. It feels like, um, he just can't win for losing. He's got some issues with his local Memphis promotion. Do you remember? you know, what your relationship was like right after Jerry left. I mean, were you guys on good speaking terms? Is it something where you knew he was upset? So let's just give it a little time. 
what was your approach? Not just from a, you know, sort of a talent relations standpoint, cause he's not technically with the company at this point, but he is your longtime pal. You're in a weird spot, right? Yeah. It was in a weird spot. Uh, I, you know, we kept in touch. Uh, we didn't keep in touch as much as we did when we were working together because then we saw each other every week. You know, we, we sat down at the table, we did a live television, the flagship show was ours to do. And, and, uh, so we had a lot more communication there, but I, I, we did communicate. I check on him and sometimes it was text messaging. Uh, that's my early days of texting. I'm sure those are some buttes. Uh, before spell check. Uh, but yeah, we kept in touch. It, it's a different thing than having a former, uh, colleague and having a friend, right? We were friends, right? And so, uh, yeah, we kept in touch and it's just a touch base. How you doing? What's going on? And he, I know that he did what he thought was right. I know he did what he thought was supporting his, his wife at the time. And I can't blame him for that. That's he felt compelled to stand by your man, so to speak. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was, it was challenging though. That just, all that stuff added to the plate. Think about all these things that we're, we're dealing with. You and I've talked about here a lot. God damn, man. I mean, come on. So, uh, losing my partner, uh, the, the XFL, uh, situation. ACW. Yeah. And all that, all that uh, accounting and all and the, and the administration administrative things there, the WCW acquisition, what are we going to do with all these talents? What's our creative going to look like? Biggest WrestleMania ever. Yeah. So it was a, it was a, it was a busy time to be honest with you. And, uh, sometimes I, it's, I look at back at it in wonderment that we were all able to pull it off and keep the rudder in the water and, uh, get through those times. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about one more thing before we jump into the show itself, because it is funny to look at some of this stuff, just in the context of, of 2021 Meltzer would report the WWF reached the deal with Sakani Inc to handle the company's videotape archives and get them ready for a potential video on demand or internet broadcast. Since the company will be owning 40 years of its own footage, as well as the old WCW slash Crockett library and the ECW library. Vince McMahon said on some recent interviews that they don't have any plans to do a 24 hour wrestling channel. According to an article in the Hollywood reporter, Sakani Inc plans to digitize the WWF's video library, which date backs to the sixties, which largely at this point would be pulling up footage a lot easier than having to search through thousands of hours of tape and film. The article said at this point, there are no specific plans as to what they'll do with the footage. Only that when technology changes to digital, they'll be ready. And it's, I've always been fascinated by the way this all came together, uh, years ago, talking to Bruce over on something to wrestle. He told me that even in the late eighties, he remembers Vince talking about a WWF network. Now, of course their vision at the time was it would be a television channel, like a, a cable station. Of course, we know it became video on demand first with the WWE 24 seven service. And then in 2014, we saw the launch of the OTT app, but now my goodness, we've got, uh, WWE selling the rights to that, to NBC and it's on Peacock. When did you think they were actually going to, to do something with this footage? Well, Vince and I talked about, uh, that, that footage, the footage starting with the AWA library. Okay. Uh, that was always kind of on the radar in that regard. Also, uh, he, uh, sent me to Dallas. Did he meaning Vince pronoun boy and, uh, uh, to talk to Mrs. Von Eric. And, uh, that was a fun trip. And I went to her home and she's such a nice Southern belle. And, Considering all the things she went through as a mom and to welcome another wrestling person inside her home, uh, really classy. So I think that as Bruce mentioned to you, you know, we looked at it as a, 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 in the days of, the, of a television uh, channel, I used to compare it or talk about it in the light of, or in something like, uh, the weather channel, Okay. who the hell would have thought a weather channel 
would ever survive. Right. And right now it's thriving and it's a big deal. Uh, but, but the land, it just showed us that the landscape of television was changing. Is our product so niche that people wouldn't, might not watch it. And we know that's not true because they just cut a huge deal with Peacock and, and the, and the, the, uh, WWE network had what over a million subscribers. So it worked. We just weren't ready to, to get there yet because we didn't, a lot of questions are unanswered, but yeah, I think, I think the thought was always at some point in time to have a, a, a network, not knowing exactly what incarnation it would take. Will it be a weather channel on basic cable systems? Will it be a digital streaming thing? And Conrad, remember back in this era, we're talking about, uh, the, the streaming topic was not developed, right? It was, there was just talk of how we could do this someday. This would be this way and that way. So I think that the libraries, you know, the ECW library, of course, UWF, uh, we bought that from Mrs. Watts. I was involved in that negotiation until I got deep into the money aspect. And because I was so close to the project with the uh, cowboy and his ex-wife, I recused myself from negotiation. I didn't want to be in that, in that circle. I didn't need to be in that circle. I, I, I had been successfully able to cultivate an interest from them in selling this asset. And it was an asset that, uh, Mrs. Watts got through the divorce. Right. So, uh, so we did, we did some good work there, but we didn't have a plan yet. And, but that's not a bad thing again. Well, why didn't you have a plan? There's gotta be more to this than that. No, it just, we didn't, all this stuff had not been developed yet. We were acquiring libraries and, and as you well know, better than anybody I know. Content is king. Yeah, it is. Content is king. So we just knew that we had plenty of content, uh, in our, in our content storage space. We just weren't sure when we were going to unpack it and when we were going to, uh, present it and in what form, but it was always the thought I thought, and at least that's my take on it, uh, going, going forward with that deal. Well, let's jump into WrestleMania 17. Uh, before the actual live broadcast starts on pay-per-view, we've got a Sunday night heat match with just incredible teaming with Xbox to take on Steve Blackman and grandmaster sexy. They got two minutes and 46 seconds. Credible and Xbox get the win. Uh, Meltzer would say there didn't seem to be any purpose to this and the crowd didn't care. Albert took out GMS, allowing the other two to super kick Blackman and Xbox pin him, uh, Xbox and just incredible and Albert are now going to be collectively known as the X factor. I guess, you know, on a pre-show like this, you just want to give people a, a look inside the arena and let them see the excitement and the capacity crowd and, and hope that that sort of pushes them over the edge to make a purchase of the pay-per-view, right? Yeah. Uh, pretty much. I think you're on the money. I think you're on the money there. You know, the idea I think a lot of times is people say, oh, I don't want to be on first. I don't want to be the first match, but it is an important match and yes. it sets the tone and it sets the pace sort of like you sort of joked about with, uh, with Steve Austin inducting you into the hall of fame at the top of the show, the first match on the pay-per-view was Chris Jericho pinning William Regal in seven minutes and eight seconds for him to retain the intercontinental title. Uh, Meltzer would say the match was fine in some ways, well wrestled by Regal. Although Jericho had one of those matches where he was slightly off on things where it ended up disappointing is that it was just too short. Jericho opened by slightly overshooting on a Pescado. Heyman did a good job setting the stage for the match, which was built around Regal working on Jericho's shoulder saying Jericho was injured from being in the Regal stretch on SmackDown. Regal posted Jericho's shoulder twice. Jericho came back with a lion salt, but Regal got his knees up. The crowd was quiet, except when they teased a signature move, Regal undid the turnbuckle and rammed Jericho's left shoulder into it twice. Jericho came back with two enziguris and a missile drop kick for a near fall. Regal did the double arm suplex off the top and a Regal stretch, but Jericho made the ropes and came back with a lion salt for the pin. The crowd wasn't ready for the match to end two stars. 
Uh, a few things I want to circle in on. Number one, where Meltzer says the crowd was quiet. We've often heard from the guys in the ring that sometimes it's challenging to work in a stadium because the sound just goes up. Right. And even in a dome, maybe the sound doesn't just go up because there is a top on it, but you're so far away from the fans that you don't feel connected. How does that affect you as an on air broadcaster? Not much because the, these headphones. Uh, pipe in the ambient noise, uh, and they are the, the crowd's mic'd. So if the crowd's mic'd, I'm hearing them. Right. Uh, that's the advantage that we have as broadcasters over the talent. They can hear them too, but maybe not as directly and as sensitively as uh, the announcers can wearing a headset, which gathers all the the uh, uh, the, the noise. Right. So uh, didn't affect us at all, quite frankly. It was, it was again, pretty cool. Uh, no issues there. I, I, I never had any issues working in a stadium because again, now if we were not wearing headsets and we couldn't hear the, the crowd, uh, yeah, that's an issue, but that's, that was never the case. And it certainly was not the case in Houston at the Astrodome. Talk to me a little bit about, uh, the, the pacing of a show like this, who would have been formatting shows at this point in terms of deciding who gets what time where they're placed on the card all that jazz well vince uh would have been at the top of the end of the table on that uh patterson probably had a big hand in it as far as order of events uh things of that nature uh you start when you do a show like that conrad you go to your most important thing that you booked or you perceive the most important thing that you booked and you give them the time that you need and start subtracting available time, uh, from the pay-per-view itself. So you work backwards in other words. And, uh, so I, I'm, uh, I'm thinking, uh, Vince, Pat was Bruce there then. Yep. Uh, Bruce would have been involved. I say that I'm not saying that as being a dick. I just, you know, Bruce, like me, Bruce came, went, you know, right. Right. I can't remember all the, all the. Timelines, timeline on that stuff. Uh, and I was asked a few questions about it. You know, to me, the, the obvious was what we're we going to close with. Right. Of course. And we knew that, you know, duh. So, uh, but Vince has been the spearhead of that uh, deal. WrestleMania has always been his baby. He created it and, uh, he, he embraced it lovingly. So, uh, but I'm, I'm thinking that a late great Pat Patterson would have been deeply involved in that as well, especially, uh, in the, in the main event and especially with the rock involved. Patterson had a very strong emotional attachment to rock to Dewey, as he called him. And he was really young. He was kind of young rock then. <laughs> so to speak, I've enjoyed yeah. that show. And I love that show on Tuesday. It's just a nostalgic young rocks, a fun show. NBC's got on the hit. And, uh, it's just amazing to me that rock and his great team are able to continue to produce uh, stellar material. And that's one of them. So I think Patterson would have probably been deeply involved and we had good agents. We had agents that uh, work with the specific talents because the talents are comfortable with them. Uh, the agents got their walking, their marching orders, uh, from the, from the, from the head office. And then they would transfer and, and relate that information to Vince and Vince. And then subsequently we'll probably have to have a conversation with the talent. Here's why we're doing this. Here's why we want to do this, et cetera, et cetera. So. But, uh, it starts and ends with Mr. McMahon. Let's, uh, let's talk about the next segment here on the show. We see Shane McMahon arrive in a limousine. It's got the license plate WCW one and somewhere else in the arena. We see the APA smoking cigars with Jacqueline and Bradshaw is just sort of running down the history of this venue. This feels like it's formatted a little bit like a Monday night raw or a, a SmackDown. Do you think that? your pay-per-view should be much different than your TV. Should it look and feel similar to TV just to have the same sort of continuity and brand identity? Or do you think that, Hey man, it's the pay-per-view. Let's just have the matches and let's let all this storytelling shit wait till Monday. Well, I think it starts and ends with the product in the ring, right? You're going to, the mere fact that you're, do, you're doing this event in a dome is uh, significant. Sure. Uh, so that's going to make it different. So I don't think 
I'm not a, I understand your question. I'm not exactly sure I know how to answer it, but I don't think it had a big issue that need to look different than a television show. How are you going to make it? How, how different can you make it? Right. Can't camera positions, the venue, uh, things of that nature, because at the end of the day, it still comes back down to the game. Sure. So, uh, no, I don't think that has, I don't think that would be a main goal, quite frankly. Well, here we go. We got our, our another great match here with uh, Bradshaw and Farouk. Uh, they're going to be teaming with Taz to take on the right to censor. It's a good father, Bull Buchanan and Val Venus heavy on characters in this one, boy, three minutes and 53 seconds. Uh, Jackie's DDT on Steven Richards right away. Uh, look nasty. According to, uh, Dave Meltzer, mainly heat on Taz who had a spot messed up when he was sitting to the ropes. Good father then sat on Taz's face while being off on a leg drop, which may have hurt Taz. And the match ended abruptly with good father missing a tackle into the buckles and Bradshaw pinning him with the clothesline, nothing to the match, half a star. You got tons of hall of fame talent in this match, but it just, for whatever reason, didn't mesh very well. Would you agree with that? Yeah. No story, right? There was no long buildup. It felt like a space holder. And that's an all due respect to the talents in there. It's not their fault that they weren't embroiled in a story prior going into WrestleMania or WrestleMania could settle something. Uh, I've always said that big matches or viable matches, important matches at WrestleMania should either be debuts or blow offs. That's my take on it. It's not a great place to continue the journey or this is chapter three of an eight chapter book. Uh, but, but above all. You've got to have a story going into the match and that put, uh, these, these gents, these six guys at a, at a little bit of a disadvantage in that regard. It was a cold match. In other words, I thought they did as good as they could do in four minutes. Uh, it was going to be, it wasn't what the fans came to see, right? They knew why they bought their ticket. They knew that why they specifically want to go to this WrestleMania. And probably, and I love all these guys. They're all, you know, Brad Shaw, Farouk, Taz, all of them. They just, uh, that was, they were not what the mass audience wanted to see. They came for something else. And then you add the fact on that these guys are working in a, uh, with no story, no buildup made it even more daunting, more challenging. Uh, I do. It's funny. You know, we talk about uh, Jackie Moore. Uh, DDT and Steven Richards, uh, it was, uh, that might be the, one of the most memorable things of the entire match. Yeah. The match, the match is a little bit awkward at times, but again, I, I, I just, the fact these guys had to hurry, it was a WrestleMania moment for them. It was a cold match. Uh, so not getting, I got a half a star. You know, what's that mean? I don't, it's, it's one person's opinion, right? Right. right. Uh, and us is fine. But it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, mean that, boy, this was a shits. We right. should never have booked this. I don't look at that. Look at it that way whatsoever. Yeah, I would agree. Let's get to uh, the next skit here on the show. We've got Trish Stratus backstage, wheeling Linda McMahon around in her wheelchair. Stephanie McMahon is going to approach and order Trish to, uh, hand, uh, to have some, some ice ready to celebrate Vince beating Shane later on. We're heavy on story here again. Um, we'll come back to it next up. We see Kane win the hardcore title over Raven and big show, uh, nine minutes and 18 seconds. Meltzer would note there's no Pete Rose this year in the Kane match. And he says, they're trying to do something different from the rest of the show and have most of the state or most of the match happen backstage. Uh, there, this is a pretty memorable match here with Raven being involved and driving the golf carts all around and. They're going through the sheetrock. It's interesting for what it is. It got a star and three quarters in the observer. Meltzer says this wouldn't be uh, the last time something this silly was on the show. What do you think about this? Is it a miss? Did they get a little too cute? A little too tongue in cheek? Might have been a little too sports Ill sports illustrated. Might have been a little too uh, uh, sports entertainment. Yeah, oriented. Uh, you know, you got it's a it's a unique balance. You know, boom, boom, boom. So it's really a unique balance in how you do that. Uh, but you know, again, the, that hardcore stuff was, 
on again, off again, story, no story on TV, not on TV. So those guys came in again with no momentum. And, but it, it, when you look back at it, there's some amazing talents, you know, Kane, Kane always delivered big matches. Uh, and he's a hall of fame guy in my view. Glenn Jacobs, not Glenn Jacobs is not in the hall of fame. Is he? Uh, no, uh, he's still wrestling. So they're not putting him in yet. No, I mean now, no. So he always had hall of fame expectations and hall of fame, uh, productivity. Very, one of the most underrated, most consistent guys that we ever, we ever had in our roster. And then he's now the mayor of, uh, Knox County, Tennessee. He's doing okay. He's the modern day Buford Pusser. <laughs> Tennessee is, is big, is a big boy. Uh, so, uh, no, nah, I, I, again, we got a three hour show to fill you and Vince's philosophy has always been, it's a little different than mine, which doesn't make it right or wrong. Probably makes it right. Cause he's the boss. Uh, I don't believe it's everybody's right to work WrestleMania. If it fits book it, if it's, it's a, if it's a gratuitous booking to make sure everybody gets on the card in the days when there were four pay-per-views and WrestleMania was by far the largest, I get it, but that was not the case, uh, in, around that time because you started having more pay-per-views. So your pay for you pay off your year. So I think you've heard guys talk about this. Well, I want to be on WrestleMania because that makes my year. Right. And that, that, that concept was viable, but it wasn't accurate in that this period of time. So I'm not saying these guys should not have wanted to be, uh, should not have been on the show. I'm just saying that sometimes things like this with really great talents involved, if they have no backstory leading into it, with no momentum seems a little bit, uh, forced. That's all. Do you remember, uh, what Vince thought of, uh, the Raven character? Um, I think he had mixed emotions. I don't know if you fully got it. I'm not so sure I got it all the time either with Raven. Uh, I'm not sure what he's trying to portray. Scotty was a very talented kid. You know, I've known him since day one. Right. Uh, he Scott, some of Scotty's best work was in Portland in my, in my view. Uh, but I don't know that he ever connected with the character Conrad. I just don't know that he did. Uh, but and because of that, you know, Raven's push, the goddamn push we're all seeking in life, uh, is, uh, was probably on again, off again, sporadic at best. Well, he has a, a real sort of highlight moment here on the show where he goes flying through, you know, from one room to another through the wall. Uh, and we've got so many of our listeners who just absolutely love the Raven character, uh, especially his ECW stuff. But there's a, a relatively famous story that's out there that says when Raven came back to the WWF here, uh, apparently there was some sort of producers meeting or writing meeting or whatever. And Vince supposedly took his glasses off and asked who the fuck hired Raven. Uh, and that I guess everyone in the room realized, okay, uh, he's not high on the old man's list. That'd you be me. That? Yeah, of course. You, Cause everybody looked at me. Okay. As they would. Cause why would you take any responsibility for contributing to the creative of bringing somebody in that the old man didn't like you right. wanted to distance yourself from that negative feel as rapidly as you could. So, uh, it's like Mikey, Mikey lead anything. Oh, Jr. hire anybody. So I hired Raven. I, I, I was like you, Conrad. I thought if we could recreate what Raven had accomplished in ECW and right. that, that character is no brainer. Yeah. But you got to have the complete support of everybody. And once the creative team saw that the most powerful man in our industry in the entire world wasn't high on him, those son bitches jumped the ship like rats. <laughs> Fact. I, uh, boy, I, I know we're probably going to piss some people off when I bring this one up, but big show. Uh, his now Paul white, he's with AEW, and he recently did an interview on Jericho's podcast, I believe, where he talked about how, uh, someone in WWE told him even after he had dropped the weight and rehabbed and, and had the surgery injury and came back, 
uh, or the, uh, the hip injury rather. And, and the whole deal. So now he's, he's a new lean, mean, big show fighting machine. They basically say, Hey, uh, you're never going to be our main event. You're never going to headline a WrestleMania. You're just here to help get younger guys over. What do you make of that statement? Is that a good policy to have and just be honest and forthright with the talent? Or you want to keep the guy motivated, especially a guy who's done all of that, where, you know, he's still got some, some prime matches left in him, or at least it feels that way from the outside looking in. I always believe that honesty is the best policy. Uh, I think as you, as you're a talent and you're competitive, you've been involved in athletics, uh, especially team sports, organized team sports that you can use that as motivation as a challenge. If you choose to, or you can have a boo-boo face yeah, and, and, you know, drag your ass around and, you know, why me, poor me, 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 I'll text you. You text me, you know, whatever. uh, don't get me started on that shit. Uh, but b- bottom line is that I think honesty is the best policy. Give them the, give them the real lay of the land. Right. And because there is something that they can do about it. Yeah. That's it's just pulling yourself up by the bootstraps and, and making changes. So apparently what you're doing in your routines in your normal matches, isn't appealing to the owner. Right. And in, in, uh, in this company, we're talking about WWE at this time, right? They, uh, uh, there was, there's plenty of opportunities to write the ship, but I, I believe the honesty is the best policy. And I'm not saying that the honesty, sometimes it's not misguided or it might not be accurate. But, but at the bottom line, at the end of the day, being honest, with the talent's the way to go. Do you, um, do you agree with the assessment? I mean, you just sort of broke it down and saying, Hey, what you're doing right now, the owner of the company, it doesn't really connect with the owner of the company. I think, uh, famously Paul Heyman, a few years ago said the WWE caters or plays to an audience of one. Do you think that's a fair assessment that really much. all about Vince? Yeah, pretty much. If Vince doesn't like your act, then you're not going to get to the promised land. It's not going to happen. He's the Steven Spielberg of, uh, of this entity. He's the executive producer. He's the creator. He's the director. That's Vince. So obviously if he didn't like something you're doing and he didn't like your act, so to speak, uh, you're in a tough spot. Absolutely. So now here's the deal. So I guess you're just screwed. You are screwed. If you're a goddamn quitter, right? You are screwed. If you don't have any character or any principles to work your way out of, a uh, this, you know, uh, conundrum and, 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 and a lot of guys had the balls to say, I'm going to change this, change the general feeling of, of my character, my TV persona. I, I had the chance to do that, whether it's new moves, it's better conditioning. It's a better pr- overall presentation, something there's things I can improve. So if you're of the uh, mindset that I want to make these guys change their mind on me through my hard work, my creativity, my effort and my, and my overall professionalism, then you got a chance to, to resurrect yourself. So again, go back to the truth, tell them the truth, tell them what they need to do. And, and go from there. But if, if the old man is not uh, sold on your act, uh, then you're in trouble. Change the perception, change the way you're perceived. And the, the vitalists will hear this say, yeah, but that is uh, JR tell a good story. It just don't work. You know, if you don't like, it, you don't like it. Well, change his mind. Right. You think he loved me from day one, with my Southern accent, and these little fat cheeks here. I'm going to guess. No, probably not. I made him like me because of my work, consistent, hard work. And, uh, I got his talents over. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, I just, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, do something about it, man. And today's world's even worse because you got what do you call them? Millennials. Yes. You know, it's never their fault. Many of these guys can't even fucking tell time, you know, <laughs> What time are you going to, I'll be there about two. What does that mean? 
what's, what's about, what time is about to, is that one fifty, two fifteen? It's their time because my time is more important than your time. So, uh, that's how I look at that deal. They just, it's bullshit, you know, uh, poor me, you know, the world's getting tired of poor me. Really, truly Conrad, come on. God damn. That's what we, we talked about that earlier, but the Twitter negativity somewhere along the way, that's just a fait accompli. People are going to quit listening to you. You know, then you, I look at people that knock me, which I don't give a shit. They knock me or not. I've been knocked for years, uh, even by my boss, uh, at the time, not now, but then, but so do something about it or lay down and let them kick you some more. Yeah. Be a wuss. You know, what the hell are you going to do about it? You know, I, I was an athlete of a small scale, but, but, but by God, my coach is never worried about me quitting or not giving effort. If I had a bad game, I'm going to make it better the next game because I'm going to correct my mistakes. Whether I believe my mistakes are right or wrong or warranted or not, I'm going to correct them. And I don't see that attitude universally utilized in today's wrestling world. I like when uh, red ass Jr. uh, sets the record straight for us. You got anything else that's annoying you giving you a burr in your saddle. Let's just talk this it. morning. Yeah. What do you got? Oh, no, I'm good. I'll go figure out some. <laughs> It'll well, come to us the, organically. Uh, we might need to need a segment here. Red ass Jr. Like a little five minute rant. Here's what, <laughs> here's what's grinded my gears this week. Uh, backstage, we see Edge and Christian, and they want to know if Kurt Angle wants to go celebrate with them after they all win their matches tonight. But our Olympic gold medalist is too concerned with watching video of Chris Benoit making him tap. And he says, if your hand taps the mat, but there's no official referee and no official bell, and it wasn't an official match, then officially you didn't tap, which is kind of fun. Great uh, heel answer. Tremendous. Right. Uh, and then we Great, see the- it, it was a plausible answer. We mentioned this earlier when heels like Heyman, we use his, him as an illustration, tell the audience things that the audience doesn't want to hear, but damn it. He's telling me the truth. Yes. That's the best. That's the, that's instead of going outlandishly over the top and, and eye rolling bullshit. Uh, that answer of Kurt angle was plausibly true. Let's move on. Let's talk about the next segment. We see the rock arrive at the arena backstage. He's going to hang up his title belt and his jacket and walk off again. And then it's time for another match. This was sort of a weird one. Eddie Guerrero is going to pin test to win the European title in eight and a half minutes. Perry Saturn is going to escort Eddie Guerrero to the ring. He's wearing a funny hat, which Meltzer describes as a cross between buff Bagwell and, uh, the furry stuff. Bruiser Brody used to wear on his boots. Uh, and Meltzer would say the real visual size problem here is the test is a legit six, six competitor and Guerrero is five, six and a half. Uh, I don't think that really mattered. I kind of like the big man, smaller man dynamic in matches. Uh, Meltzer didn't hate it either. He gave it two and a quarter stars. Um, test does a pump handle slam on Guerrero and punches Saturn, but Guerrero kicks out of the pin. Dean Malenko would come out and distract the referee while Guerrero gets the title belt and hits test with it. And there's your pin. So the radicals are here and they're making an impression. And Guerrero is now the European champion in hindsight with all the pomp and circumstance surrounding a WrestleMania. I think I wish Eddie had a different opponent here, not to disparage test. I just know that uh, Eddie could have shown us some more Matt wrestling and maybe less character stuff here. what do you think? I always loved Eddie's matches. Uh, quite frankly. And to him, it was a challenge to get a good match out of test. Right. Uh, Andrew Martin was a good guy, uh, left us too soon. Uh, couldn't, couldn't manage his demons, unfortunately, like so many others in our world, not just in wrestling. So, uh, but I, I had no issues with it. Eddie looked at those matches knowing that, uh, test was had a somewhat restricted skill set to make a better match out of it than people would expect it would be. Eddie loved those challenges. He prided himself in making everybody he worked with better and pulling off a good match. And I thought that they did that. And it was a good place for, uh, the other radicals to get a little rub, get a little, get a little something, something. So I, I enjoyed that match. Uh, I'm with you. Of course, could there have been a better opponent? Well, of course there could have been a better opponent, but uh, it, that was not what was booked. And so I thought the guys that made it that were in the match 
did the best they could. And, uh, we got nice exposure for, uh, for Malenko and for Perry Saturn. So, yeah, I have, I had no problem with it. Quite frankly, Connor, I thought they did a good job and, you know, uh, Eddie just always amazed me how great he is or was. And I was always a big fan of his. I, I have to admit that I was not overwhelmed, uh, with that six, six versus five, six, uh, because of the battles that I fought to overcome those cats, lack of height to right. the old man, to the old man. But in any event, they pulled it off. They got the work done and, and, uh, made a, I thought they made a good representation of uh, the show, uh, on the show, uh, in this match. So, and like I said, you know, you mentioned two and a quarter stars, might've given it more than that. I have a hard time giving Eddie Guerrero two stars in a WrestleMania or for anything. Yep. Let's, uh, let's talk about what's next. We see backstage. Michael Cole is interviewing Mick Foley and Steve Austin walks into the dressing room and gets a huge pop. Uh, but then it's time for another barn burner. It's Kurt angle and Chris Benoit. I understand that a lot of people can't watch and enjoy Chris Benoit matches, but this is a good one. It goes 14 minutes and two seconds, but angle is out here insulting Texas and this capacity crowd to make sure that everybody understands I'm the bad guy. Yeah. And, uh, cheer Chris Benoit here. Uh, this is a really, really good match. Uh, it, it is sort of old school. You would see the fans politely applaud the mat work, uh, because they are doing more ground-based stuff. Uh, Meltzer loved it. He gave it four and a quarter stars. Uh, he would say it's very similar to early Don Fry in Japan in the context of a match. It looks real, something that is simple, but not breaking clean on the ropes can generate a lot of heat. After the match, Angle did an interview and Benoit attacked him and put him in the cross face and Angle tapped again. So it's a, it's a big moment for Kurt Angle, a big WrestleMania moment, if you will. And we're not quite to where he's working the main events. We know just two years from now, he and Brock Lesnar will close the show, but my goodness, what a talent Chris Benoit is in this era. And, uh, he had an opponent that he could work with and, and have a high level match. And I thought. They were at this point stealing the show. Now, of course, we know we've got some spectacles coming. Mm-hmm. This was one hell of a match. What do you think? Uh, I I love the chemistry those guys had. I love the physicality. You can tell by the lockups. Yeah. You know, folks, when you go watch a, a big match or back in time like this one, you go back and check out certain matches, and this is one I'm sure that Conrad and I will both uh, recommend you watch at some point in time. Uh, it was that good. Uh, and the guys had great psychology. They had physicality, but when you watch a match like this, look at things as simplistically as the lockup, watch how guys lock up. They make contact. They show physicality. They mean what they're doing because the lockup in the real world is very, very imperative, very important. It's, it creates control for, for one of these two individuals. So I thought that they, the little things, the lockups are stiff and there's a difference in being stiff and being dangerous. Maybe stiff is not the right word. Maybe snug is a better word. There you go. A stiff kind of indicates you're, you're, uh, advocating somebody getting hurt or almost getting hurt. You, it, 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 it talks about injury or it makes you think of injuries and that's not what we're looking at doing here. So I thought they had a hell of a match. It was a big match for Kurt. It was a big match for Benoit. Excellent booking. Uh, look, I, 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 I so, uh, I so detest that weekend that, that Chris had his, uh, issues really do, especially when I knew his wife and his little boy, as well as I did, you know, uh, golly, but, uh, I don't have that issue with like some fans do. I can't watch a Benoit match. Okay. Well, that's your prerogative. Right. I'm not going to knock you because you don't like to watch a Benoit match. I get it. Sure. Yeah. It does, but it doesn't affect me that way. Now, would I sit down and watch a Chris Benoit marathon? Probably not. But to go back and pick out a match out of a great WrestleMania such as this, or two guys that got a tremendous four and a quarter stars. Yeah. So far, it's the biggest star award in the whole show. Yeah. 
So why wouldn't you go back and watch a wrestling match featuring these two guys? Uh, it, it wouldn't, that would not bother me. And I, by no means am I condoning, uh, the, the last 24, 48 hours of Chris Van Wall's life. No, not whatsoever. Not. Yeah. But I understand your point too. You know, some people just, I'm not going to watch any more of that stuff. Okay. Let's don't watch it. Right. That's easy. I'm not going to try to talk you into it. If you're, if you're not comfortable watching anything, you shouldn't watch it. I mean, it's a free country. Let me ask about Chris Benoit for a moment here. Do you remember there ever being a situation where, uh, he wasn't happy with some creative and, or he wasn't happy, quote unquote, putting someone over. He felt like he needed to, to win a match and wanted to finish overturned or something like that. I've never, never heard anything like that with Benoit. Okay. Total pro. He had the confidence in his own skill set, Conrad, to make any match good. And he understood the art of working a pro wrestling match. Whereas when the match was over, he left win or lose better than he arrived. That's an art form. And some people blow that shit off. Oh, okay, JR's. That's an art form. So, uh, and if you can't see that folks, then you're missing the point. That's a great worker. You leave better than you arrived. And Chris Benoit was able to do that because of his uh, skill set. And Benoit enjoyed making others better. He didn't go lay down because he was doing a job. I've seen guys that if I, I've seen guys that if I didn't know the finish, how they walked to the ring on their introduction, told me that they're doing the honors tonight. Yeah. It's so silly. You know, it's like I'm playing a cowboy in a movie and I get shot in the third scene with an arrow. Oh, uh, I, I can't, I just, that's bad. That's bad. Uh, directing That's bad casting. Come on. So I, I, uh, I, I just know that Chris had, a, took a lot of pride in making guys better and he would help them with their matches, make their matches better. Uh, you had to come ready to go with him. And so, uh, and I'm praising him now. It sounds like, and I am for his work in the ring, not for his last weekend on earth. Yeah, there is a difference between the two. Yep. Let's talk about what happens next on the show. We've got a little backstage skit here where we see William Regal discover that Kamala is standing on his desk. I like the, uh, nod to the nostalgia here. And then we see a, uh, a video package that's showing us some of the WWF superstars taking part in a WrestleMania pep rally with members of the armed forces. We come back into the arena. We see Kevin Kelly trying to interview Kurt Angle, but Benoit is going to attack him and put him in a cross face. And then we get a second video package. And this one is going to highlight the rivalry between China and the WWF women's champion ivory. This is uh, a big moment for China here. She's going to win the title from ivory in two and a half minutes. Reluctantly. She did Relu- reluctantly. She yeah. Shit. No, she didn't want to win the title. She didn't want to work with women. Right. Cause of she, her look and the, she was a big advocate of the intergender stuff and, and folks that, you know, know me, that's, that's not my cup of tea. Do I hate it? Do I, do I am I against anybody that works intergender matches or are they, do they become on my shit list? Oh, Jr. said, oh, he's on that damn tirade again. Last week was on Andrade announced those goddamn intergender matches. He's senile. I told you he was senile in a tweet and all 14 of my followers loved it. Jesus Christ. Uh, she didn't want to wrestle women. Uh, that was not her lot in life. She felt like she was above that because of her look and her size. Now in today's world, so if people say, well, in today's world, it wasn't in today's world back then. That was back then. This 2001 is 20 years ago. Women's wrestling has come farther in the last 20 years or so than at any other time, at least in my lifetime in history. So the, with the list of talents that are out there now, uh, you, you know, she, she could have some matches if she wanted to, or she could get in the ring with somebody like Oscar or, uh, Thunder Rosa or, or whomever and get her ass whipped. But that was not, you know, she knew she had an end and she, she, she was politically connected and she just thought she was above working with women. And I felt bad for, for, uh, Lisa Moretti, uh, you know, Lisa Moretti didn't do any harm to China. No, Lisa's a pro. Yes. And a lovely person. I think the world of her, 
uh, and she helped us so much uh, in the in the development of the of the divas back in those days. That was the thing about it is that China did not want to be known as a diva, right? But she wanted to look like a diva, hence getting her jaw done and all those things. So it was a two, it was a two way street here. I wasn't sure what what lane she was in sometimes, but I do know that she did not want to work with women. Well, she would come to me and say, well, how, how are you going to use me on the next house show run? Who am I going to work with? And so, you know, we just felt like that having a champion that looked like her, she was like a Hogan. Right. And so, you know, and, and that's not a, that's a compliment by the way. So, but she didn't see it that way. She saw herself in a different league. That's why she, when she ended up leaving, she was demanding she get paid as much as Austin. Right. So uh, that would, that would be reasonable. I mean, that would be plausible. I said, you can make a lot of money, but you're not gonna get guaranteed that a million dollars a year. So now we know that there's a lot of women in wrestling are making a million dollars a year because the landscape has changed over the last 20 years. We're talking about 2001. And so, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I thought the cover was a shits, you know, she let China laid on her back which is lazy shit, disrespectful. And I, and I don't tirade of knocking Joni. I spent more time trying to help Joni than probably any other talent on the roster for a, a period of time there. But she just had a very strange, uh, outlook. It's a very strong, uh, anxiety. She was not, she didn't have a lot of self-confidence. She's always wanted to change her body, change her face, change this, change that, but get sexier but not wrestle women. So you want to be a sexy woman, but you don't want to wrestle women. So I'm supposed to book you with the guys that, uh, you can beat. That's another issue. Well, why would I wrestle and not? Well, go over. Hello. This shit show biz. That's how you cast tonight. So I don't know. It was just a, got to be a pain in the ass. Quite frankly, uh, that whole trying to keep her happy. And of course her personal life wasn't doing her any favors. Let's, uh, let's talk about the match itself. Meltzer didn't tell all that differently than you. He says, China has dropped a lot of weight slimming down, but also dropping a lot of muscle mass to try and give her a more mainstream. Look match was terrible because it was a total ego show. China blew off the injury angle. Ivory hit her with a belt shot at the bell, but she made a quick comeback and it was a one-sided squash. China gave her a power bomb and then lifted her up at two. Then she gave her a press slam and pinned her by, by, by just laying backwards. Like it was a piece of cake showing her no respect at all. Uh, he gave it negative one star. Um, I don't know that there's anything else to say there. Is there? It's embarrassing. You don't go to WrestleMania. You're going to win the title before 67,000 plus people. And you don't put out the effort that the match, the place, the time and the opponent deserved totally unprofessional in my view. And I, it's, and these shows are challenging to do Conrad because so often we're speaking of those who are no longer with us. Right. And I have a hard time with that, quite frankly. So I said, well, it didn't sound like you did. You just got in quarter China, my favorite. Look at the evidence, your honor. Look at the evidence and tell me that that wasn't a poor representation of professionalism in pro wrestling. Uh, and I, I just, I was very disappointed in that match, but I can't tell you that I was shocked by it. The, the South, the saving grace was Conrad. It was mercifully short. Yes, Thank goodness. The next uh, thing we see on the show is, uh, Jeff Pagwell and Moses Alou, the Astros, they're interviewed at ringside. Uh, Bagwell said that wrestlers were great actors. I can't believe that this actually made the air. It was live. I think, did you, did you hear it uh, or, or are you not, are you doing something else at that moment? No, I heard it. It was eye rolling. He's got to cover his ass because of the ego. Hey, look, I watch it every now and then. I used to watch it when I was a kid. How many times you heard these stories, right? I don't watch it anymore. You know, uh, those guys are great gymnasts or they're great uh, actors. Never about the athleticism. Uh, didn't Bagwell have issues with substance abuse? Yes, sir. Allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah. He didn't mention that though. 
So yeah. let's not embarrass ourselves by saying we, uh, you know, I'm a wrestling fan or I've been watching wrestling. He could have easily said, I've been watching wrestling all my life. And I'm so excited to be here at the Astrodome. I wish we could draw this kind of crowd. I didn't like it. It was unnecessary, but he wasn't thinking through and, and the producer should have given you some suggestion. Up. Well, you give him, you give your, your guy like that, some suggestions of sound bites. Yeah. Some line. Hey, yeah. Help him out a little bit instead of leaving to create content for himself, which obviously was ignorant and, uh, ill-timed. Next up, we've got uh, Vince backstage making sure that Trish Stratus knows to bring Linda down to the ring during his match with Shane. And then we see Michael Cole interrupt him to discuss Shane buying WCW, but Vince isn't interested in that. And then we see a video package sort of chronicling the rivalry between Vince and Shane, including Vince telling Shane he wished he'd never been born. Uh, what do you think of all of this uh, McMahon infighting? Was this good for the show, do you think? Uh I think so. I did too. It, it, it was real, real, plausibly real. Obviously, Vince never thought he was. Vince never thought that it was a shame that he had a son. Oh, of course no. Yeah. Come on. Uh, so it was, it was personal. It was pl again plausible. Well, that's Vince. You know, he's just poor Shane. Uh, and so I, I, but I did like it woven into the fabric of the storylines and the show, this whole McMahon thing was, look, it was, it was a hot topic. Shane buying WCW allegedly, of course, uh, you know, we'd have somewhere along the way, we'd have matches with four McMahons in the corners would have this match here was a very, uh, unique one to say the least. And so I, but I like the, I like the, I like the theory of doing reality based storylines. And that was plausibly real. That's really the reason I was asking is, you know, you mentioned the prior WrestleMania was uh, McMahon in every corner. Of course, WrestleMania 2000 is the one that Austin has to miss because he's out with that neck surgery. So we, we try a McMahon in every corner and our follow up to that the next year at WrestleMania is Vince versus Shane. And you sort of talked about it a little earlier that a lot of talent on the roster feel like, Hey, I've been here working all year long. I, I need my WrestleMania moment, uh, not only for history, but for the big payday. And then you see there's so much time dedicated to a McMahon storyline. Does anybody even dare bring that up to you and, and, and have sort of heartburn about that? Or do they understand it's his fucking company. What do you want me to do? Nobody complained one bit. Good. They were, they were afraid that if I slipped and said something about it, to the wrong people and it got back to Vince, uh, then all you're, all they're doing is, uh, indicting Vince for a poor storyline and, and featuring his family more than the boys. You know, the thing about it is that McMahon, uh, it, it was selling pay-per-views and the more pay-per-views he sold, the more money, the talents made, no matter where they were on a card, the pie was bigger. Their slice is going to be bigger if the pie is larger. And that's kind of how I look at it. Let's talk about, uh, the sort of the backstory here. This whole feud with Vince and Shane started with Vince's disapproval of the job that Mick Foley had done as the commissioner. And then Foley made a decision to hold a six man hell in a cell match at Armageddon 2000. And despite his attempts, Foley was given full support by Linda McMahon. Now pleased with this result, Vince immediately demands a divorce from Linda. Shortly after Armageddon, it's revealed that Linda was rushed to the hospital, suffering a nervous breakdown with Linda, Linda now hospitalized. The board of directors appoints Vince as the new CEO of the WWF, which allows him the ability to fire Foley as a commissioner with Linda. Now in a coma like state, Vince starts having a very public affair with Trish and a no way out. Stephanie and Trish actually square off with Stephanie scoring the victory after interference by William Regal. On the February 26th Raw, the match was supposed to be Vince and Trish against Stephanie and Regal, but Stri Trish wound up having sewage dumped over her. That's a real sentence. And then in the following weeks, Vince would continue to demean Trish, having her do stuff like bark like a dog or strip down to her lingerie, whatever. And then uh, Shane McMahon comes back on March 12th, and he's immediately attacking Vince only to be stopped by William Regal. 
And now we've got our match. It's Shane McMahon versus Vince McMahon in a street fight at WrestleMania. Uh, Shane gets the win in 14 minutes and 12 seconds. These guys are potatoing the shit out of each other for real. Uh, there is some, some blood. They're going through Spanish announce tables. They're pulling out all the big spots, but what gets the absolute biggest reaction so far in the show is when Linda McMahon simply stands up from a chair and gives Vince a low blow. But when she went from being comatose to standing, the fans erupt. It's probably the biggest pop of the night at that point. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it's what they wanted to see. Yeah. It's what they pronoun boy again. I've been working Shivani too long. Uh, <laughs> he hit him. Who's he? Who's him? Never mind. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, it's what they want. They, the fans wanted to see because they knew that it just also shows you how much Vince was over. Oh yeah. And they wanted him to get his comeuppance and they saw how Linda had been so wronged and Vince had, had disrespected her and uh, with this, uh, uh, debacle of an affair that he let get on uh, public, go public. So, uh, I always used to like the fact I used to kid Vince about it too. How many times are you going to kiss, kiss? How many times are you going to kiss Trish tonight? Yeah. Ha ha ha. Ha ha ha. thinking the thought cloud above his head as many times as I want. Ha ha ha. So anyway, everybody got any more heat. They felt people felt sorry for poor little Trish. She was that little Jezebel. She was being taken advantage of and, uh, abuse, so to speak in a verbal kind of a way. So, but she, Chris did a, ro a role there very well. And it had to be an uncomfortable role because what president were there for someone to be in her role, to be cast like she was cast. Right. Uh, and she pulled it off very well. So, uh, tip the hat to Trish on that deal. She did great, but she was always real smart. She processed information. She knew why she was there. She knew her role as the rock would say, and uh, she did a phenomenal job in that presentation. Big, big key part of it. I like you said, she knew her role as the rock would say, let's move on. Uh, the finish of this match is pretty notable. It's the van terminator. So Shane is going to go quote unquote coast to coast and uh drop kick that garbage can into Vince's face. What's going through your mind when you see this, this is you know, your, your boss and your old broadcast partner and a guy you're in the office with every day in the trenches every day. And, and he's not a professional wrestler and neither is his son, but here they are at the biggest WrestleMania ever doing their best and doing a damn good job at trying to steal the show here. Meltzer gave it a three-star match and you know, he was probably itching not to, but this was such a good story and so well done for what it was. It's hard not to be proud of these guys, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you kind of hold your breath. Yeah. Because it's feast or famine. There's no retakes. It's not done on a tape show where we can go back and pick it up and, 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 and edit it back in. It was feast or famine. You either hit it or you crashed and burned and made yourself look like shit. They pulled it off. And that's not, you know, Rob Van Dam's an extraordinary athlete who kind of created that scenario. Yes. Uh, and, and he's one of the few guys that could really pull that off. Right. Cause Van Dam never came up short that I saw. He was always oh. on his spot. Yes. Uh, and so you wonder, can Shane execute the coast to coast as effectively as the creator of the coast to coast RVD? That's what you're, you're wondering. Cause you, you can see the spot coming. I mean, you got Vince in one corner with a can in front of him sitting in front of his face, RVD boom. Uh, you just hope that, uh, nobody gets killed on it, but I, I, they pulled it off. And that's, again, as I said, that's not an easy spot to do. And, uh, especially for a novice and, and Shane was a novice. He was just, you know, he was a stunt man. He wasn't a seasoned pro wrestler, right? More of a, a daredevil for lack of a better term. And he pulled it off. Amazingly well, after the match, we see uh, footage from the access convention where we would see uh, 
Kevin, Kevin Kelly interrupt the Hardy boys autograph signing to ask him about the TLC. These guys say they're nervous, but also excited back in the arena. We see triple H sitting in his dressing room, grunting while the undertaker's hanging out in the boiler room, shadow boxing. Of course, they're going to meet later on the show, but up next is something people still talk about to this day. Probably the most famous match on this whole card, which is saying something considering what all we've covered so far, it's the TLC with the Dudleys, the Hardys, and Edge and Christian. Edge and Christian regain the tag straps here. This match is really beyond description. I think you've got to see it. If you're a wrestling fan and you, you're hearing this and you haven't seen it, go ahead and stop our podcast and go watch that right now. You'll be glad you did, and we'll be back here when you get back. Uh, <laughs> but if you have seen the match, but it's been a while, I can't recommend watching it enough. I think this is one of those spectacles that, is is really the definition of a wrestlemania moment Meltzer gave it four and three quarter stars uh as silly as that sounds i think you could argue that's a little low i don't know that this was great for the longevity of anyone's careers but what a spectacle it was what did you think and uh, you watched it back this week for the first time in 20 years can you take us back to being in the arena that day watching this live and trying to do your best to put into words what you're seeing well, you just let your instincts take over Conrad, quite frankly, that's what one does in that regard, because there was no precedent for this match. Well, I've seen this before uh, to me, this is all new, uh, in the, in the, in the big picture. Uh, I, I can't speak highly enough of these guys, everybody that got involved in it contributed greatly, but it was, everything was new. Everything was fresh. I, I, what are they going to do next? Cause nothing was predictable. And he had six guys that were very hungry, all looking to break loose, all looking to have their WrestleMania moment and to better stabilize their position in the company. So I, I was, a, I was completely blown away by it. You know, I'm, I'm with you. I'm not sure what, how these ratings are. I guess they're just Dave's gut feelings yeah. or whatever. Uh, and that's what it is, uh, a very educated man's opinion. But, uh, I thought those guys over exceeded. I didn't know what to expect in this match. And, uh, and they delivered, man. I mean, yeah. they delivered big time. It was, it was really phenomenal when you have a match that's in the middle of a pay-per-view that is so, uh, memorable that it, that that match becomes the title of a subsequent pay-per-view. Yeah. That's pretty incredible. It is. So, uh, I'm, I'm a big, uh, big fan of all those guys and what they did. You know, nobody had any fear. Nobody had any reservations. Nobody worried about getting their shit in, you know, they didn't it is, they, everybody could have co cooperated in the one main purpose. And that was to get the match over and entertain the hell out of the audience. And I can only imagine sitting there in the Astrodome where you could see the, how the ladder and the title hanging and all those things, uh, how amazing it must've been, but that's, uh, those guys got a hell of a payday out of that deal too. Probably the biggest paydays they ever got in their life. I can't remember if that's the one that they were complaining about, or maybe another one. I'm not sure, but, uh, I think they complained about the no mercy one might be. I don't remember. Hey, every pay-per-view had some basic similarities, you know, that somebody's going to bitch about a payoff and that's part of the system being the shits because it's called discretionary income. So it's a judgment call, always a judgment call. And the way we did those payoffs on the pay-per-views on the pay-per-views was I would work up the pay sheet, present it to Vince and basically make my presentation. And, uh, he would, he would always he always had to change a few things, which is certainly his prerogative. And again, it was discretionary income. So there's no right or wrong. Right. So these guys made a real good payday on that show. They deserved it. Uh, they may say to this very day, well, we should have made more. Well, you should have, you might've been booked in the goddamn bingo hall too. You know, you, it, it's, you got a great opportunity here. And the great thing about these guys, they all six ran with the opportunity. Look at the, you know, Christian is, uh, now with us at AEW, 
He's going to be a big player for us. He's still got plenty of matches left in him. He's got unfinished business. He wants to, to prove for his own legacy. Uh, Edge, he's, he's back headlining WrestleManias. He's in the Hall of Fame. The Hardys. I don't know if that the Hardys are able to make it to the Hall of Fame in WWE because of Matt's relationship with AEW, which would be a crime. But uh, and then of course, uh, uh, Bubba and Devon uh, are in the Hall of Fame. So it really launched and opened the eyes of a lot of people uh, of the of the abilities of these of these guys. I'll be forever indebted to the match they had, and for the professionalism they had, the, the risk they took, because basically you've got. Bubba and Devon are the catchers, right? Then you got some flyers that got to be caught. And, uh, I thought Jeff Hardy was amazing in that match, especially not that the other guys weren't here's what you're getting some fans. Well, he picked out Jeff Hardy said he was did a nice job, but he shit on everybody else. Conrad, everybody else got a large peanut sized filled dump. So no, Jeff Hardy was extraordinary in that match. Think of some of the bumps he took, but that's not good for the dirt. We need dirt. By God, we got to have dirt or it's, if it's a dirt free environment, I'm out, I'm out. <laughs> Insanity. Oh gosh. Uh, go watch this. We can't put it over strong enough. Uh, right. Lita, Lita's going to take a, a 3d through a table. Jeff's going to do a swanton off a 14 foot ladder. Edge is going to spear Hardy as he's hanging off of the belts. Like amazing words. Can't describe what this was. Uh, I can't imagine trying to follow this, but they do. Uh, but before they do, Howard Finkel announces that WrestleMania 17 had set the all time attendance record for any event at the Houston Astrodome, 67,925 fans. And before the gimmick battle Royal, Gene Okerlund was introduced as our guest play by play announcer. And our old pal, Bobby Heenan came to the ring, making his first WrestleMania appearance since WrestleMania nine, man, how great. And, and just on time was this nostalgia of having uh, Bobby and mean Gene together here. It was great because the other thing about that Conrad was that it was a, this gimmick match, the gimmick battle Royal, which Patterson gave it the name Oh, the gimmick. They had all the gimmick. Look at the gimmick. Look, he's a gimmick. Uh, Bruce here to give Pat Patterson impersonation. Uh, uh it, it was exactly what we needed for that let up segment that let up, let me up match following the TLC Yeah, to follow the TLC with another basic wrestling match would have been a fart in church. And, uh, that's not good. So, uh, this is perfect placement and, uh, and for God's sakes, it only went three minutes, but give you time to catch your breath, exhale, uh, go pee pee. Get your soda or whatever, you know, something to drink. Uh, and it was great seeing all these people. Uh, that was that one line there. I see on the script, Bobby joked it by the time Iron Sheet gets to the ring, it'll be WrestleMania 38. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but here's the thing backstage with all these guys in the battle Royal, it was kind of cool seeing a lot of the most famous and well-respected main event level talents ever in wrestling. Get that one more dance at during the big show. And I thought that was cool as hell, you know, especially for older guys. And there are a lot of older guys, but I mean, uh, Heenan and, and Gene had a great time. As a matter of fact, uh, somebody said, well, during this match, uh, you guys can go to use the bathroom. And I said, Ain't no way I'm missing this. Right. I'm wearing darks anyway, so I'm good. So, uh, that. you know, what the hell? So I'm not going to miss this. So Heyman and I sat at our spot at the announce table right beside Gene and Bobby, and we could hear all the commentary. And sometimes you could tell Heenan was trying to entertain us. Right. And it was just beautiful. So, uh, but the, the art and the, really the simplicity 
But the art of this booking was the fact that it was the perfect match to follow TLC. Nothing else we had could have done that. The uh, gimmick battle Royal here has the bushwhackers, Duke Drosse, earthquake goon, doink, the clown, Kamala, kimchi, repo man, Jim Cornette, Nikolai Volkoff, Michael Hayes, one man gang, uh, gobbledygooker, tugboat, hillbilly Jim, brother, love Sergeant slaughter. Uh, a lot of the wrestlers got no reaction according to Dave Meltzer, which isn't a surprise because some of them in their heyday also got no reaction. Bushwhackers <laughs> were cult favorites. Hayes was big in Texas. Love of course is from Houston uh, and Jim because of the catchy in- catchy entrance music all got nice reactions. Uh, when we talked about this match with Bruce once before he said the iron Sheik had to win. And I said, why was that? And he said, because we couldn't figure out how to eliminate him without hurting him because he's obviously not getting around the best. Right. And I just thought that was interesting that we decide uh, who's going to win based on who can actually perform this stuff physically. But I agree with you. Super nice to see these guys back. Nice to give everybody uh, a sort of one last moment. But I think the takeaway from our entire breakdown of this match so far, Jim, is you saying, uh, I'm not going to go pee. I'm wearing darks anyway. <laughs> but, well, me, I, I know I'm asking a, a silly question here, but how many times do you think you've pissed your pants over the years where you just couldn't leave the desk and Hey, this is live TV folks. Here's the dirt Conrad. I keep a scorecard. <laughs> I keep a log, but there's an app. I have a, I have a, I have a JRP app. <laughs> well, I can tell you this. I don't have the number, but it's certainly been more than once. Okay. It's just tremendous. What a story. What dedication you have to your craft God, sir. I'm not going to leave my post as they say. And, uh, I don't know, you know, that where darks has kind of a, been a running joke for years, but you know, sometimes here's, here's the, it's a double-edged sword. You drink coffee or hot tea for your pipes Yep. and to keep, and to keep lubricated and, and so forth. And then, uh, with all that consumption of, of liquids, gotta go somewhere, gotta go somewhere, baby. And so what do you do? Right. I remember it was a funny story when, uh, when Booker first started doing some broadcasting along that time, he had to go so bad he could taste it. And, uh, uh, he just got up and went to the bathroom and everybody looked at it incredulously, like, how dare you pee? Right. How dare you, how dare you allow your bodily functions to get the better of you? And you'd left your post to go pee pee. Bruce has got a pay pay. Uh, so, uh, I, I, it's just what you got to do. You know, I don't know. I don't know how, I don't know any other way to, to do it. Somebody said you should get a catheter. Oh my gosh. And you should go screw yourself. <laughs> well, you, you wear a catheter for three hours and then tell me how you liked it. My fat ass ain't wearing no goddamn cat. I've done, I've done when I was in intensive care for the Mike colon thing, uh, the, that got so nicely repaired by Dr. Heine. Uh, I had to wear a catheter for a week. Not fun. It's no just shit. not fun. And, uh, so I never went the catheter route. I just wore darks. And you know what? There, that's Dr. Heine calling you right now to check in. See how yeah. things are going. You know, it's funny because I think a lot of us sort of take that for granted, but I've been lucky enough to hang out with you and Tony at a show. And as soon as you guys get done, as soon as you're off the air, it is a fucking mad dash. You guys in Excalibur to go find uh, a restroom. Yeah. It's a sense of urgency to say the least. Uh, we have that, but that's the deal, man. You, you strain, you, you try to stay lubricated. You, you consume more alcohol, more alcohol. You consume not no alcohol, but you consume more liquid. And at some point in time, it's got to, like you said, it's got to go somewhere. So, uh, I don't think Tony and, and Excalibur have my same philosophy because here's the deal. If I, if we're on a roll and we're doing good or not doing good, I, I, uh, I'm not going to leave to go to the bathroom. I'm just going to take care of it. It's just as nature intended. And, and I'm going to, when I'm done, I'm going to not stick around and bullshit everybody. Hey, great job, brother. I just have a hug, brother, blah, 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 blah. My ass is going to the bathroom. 
And, and, and when we work at, at Daly's place, considering I live maybe 25 minutes in Daly's place, my ass is going home. Right. I'm taking off my wet, my wet apparel. I'm taking a shower and I'm maybe having some chocolate cake and I'm calling it a day. I have no pride or no sense of, <laughs> oh my God, I, I can't believe it worked tonight. I pissed myself. I'm in the hall of fame. I'm a hall of fame pisser. <laughs> so it's, it's what you do, man. It's just what you do. And, and uh, that's kind of been my mantra. Uh, it, was, it all started these, these pay-per-views and the, the length of them, you know, it's different than, I don't, I, I admire, you know, uh, those cats <coughs> on raw, uh, that work a three hour show. Right. And, uh, I, I, I haven't seen that show in a while to know if they're wearing darks or not, but if they're not wearing darks, I'd be shocked. Well, there's no, there's no crowd now. They could just probably just put a spittoon under there and just take care of business. A spittoon. <laughs> that's all. Yeah, that's it. A spittoon. Yeah. Let, let, let's, let's, uh, let's text Corey Graves. See if he's just, uh, filling spittoons next up. We got the undertaker and triple H. Here's the backstory after defeating Steve Austin in a two out of three falls match at no way out. Triple H feels that he deserves to be in the WrestleMania main event, having defeated everyone in the company, including Stone Cold and uh, The Rock. The Undertaker took exception to that and told him that Triple H never defeated him. And believe it or not, the two had never faced each other one on one in a match on pay per view. Uh, during his entrance for uh, a hardcore title match against Big Show, Triple H attacked uh, The Undertaker. Kane would run in and save The Undertaker, but winds up being attacked by The Big Show. On the following episode of SmackDown, Undertaker tries to break into the limousine of Triple H and his wife, Stephanie, but winds up being arrested by the police. And as a result, Kane requests a match against Triple H later that night, but he loses again when Big Show interferes. And now we've got a video package that uh, highlights the rivalry and it's time for the match. Motorhead plays Triple H to the ring. Uh, I like this you know, live band component of WrestleMania is it makes it seem bigger than life. I think a lot of our listeners probably like motorhead. what do you think of that? Using a live band to do the theme music. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Uh, and not, ex not cheap travel expenses, a payday, uh, hearing them rehearse in the afternoon was really cool. Uh, and of course that was triple H's music and. And, uh, you know, I thought it was pretty unique. It, it really made it, it was a signature opportunity for triple H and we we're still in the building process with him process with him. And obviously he would have been well taken care of because look at who he beat, you know, he was, he was getting his body of work together and, and the foundation of what he was doing was cool. <clears throat> I remember Vince not talking about the, the show. And, uh, we we had these sheets where you have an eight and a half by 11, I guess that's what a regular sheet is. And on one side of it, you had all the baby faces and then right across the same sheet, you had all the heels. So when you book somebody like for a house show run or whatever, you just mark their name off. And the irony was, is that when we started playing this card, two very prominent names had not been marked off undertaker and triple H. This oh shit. Well, we didn't have time to really build a great long story, but because the undertaker's tenure and being over triple H getting over, uh, we didn't have such second, we weren't second guessing that, but I'm not going to tell you that th their booking was an accident. It wasn't an accident, but it was an afterthought because they weren't involved in a primary story. This thing was so heavily Austin rock oriented. That it was well, what the ladder match? We had no idea, Conrad, that ladder match is going to be a phenomenal success until we saw it. And those guys over delivered. So, uh, the Undertaker Triple H match kind of came together late. Uh, but, but you knew that it's going to be a hell of a match because you got two amazing talents in there. And they told a good story. They got plenty of time, 18 minutes and change. So, uh, I, I thought it was, uh, to come together late, I thought it was a, a really good uh, outing for both those guys. And quite frankly, 
I, I may be hypocritical. What I said earlier where everybody doesn't deserve to be on WrestleMania undertaker and triple H deserved to be on WrestleMania. Of course. Come on. So, uh, I'm glad that they, uh, were, and they got, they did a great accounting for himself. So, uh, anyhow, it was good. What, what, what did I get knocked for in this one? I got knocked for something. Oh, did you? It says there in the notes. Uh, Ross talked about a big backdrop of the concrete. They showed more replays of the same. Then they killed it with the final replay, actually showing his landing was into a gimmicked foam rubber pit, basically turning the match from serious to comedy and making Ross look bad, trying to sell it as devastating. Well, if that's the only thing I look bad at in that show, I'll take it. Yeah, it, it is a good match. Uh, they get 18 minutes and 17 seconds. Um, it's three and a half stars that, that, you know, you just described the big bump, but eventually they have the undertaker use the tombstone, but there's no referee. He sets up the last ride power bomb, but this is a nice moment for triple H to hit him in the head with the sledgehammer and potato him. He busts the undertaker open, but it's a really cool visual and a hell of a counter. But of course the undertaker quickly comes back and wins with the last ride power bomb. They go on to have two more WrestleMania matches against each other. Uh, it feels like we always talk about the Austin rock trilogy at WrestleMania, but undertaker triple H had a trilogy of their own. Where do you rank this one? The first one? Well, it's hard to beat your first time. Conrad, you remember yeah. your first time, right? Oh, sure. You were in the eighth grade. She was your English teacher. I've heard these stories, folks. Sure. <coughs> oh, anyway, I'm kidding. Uh, I, I, wore, I, 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 wore I'll darks. Go. I wore darks. Don't worry about it. Good boy. And Kleenex. You had plenty of Kleenexes on hand. Always. Yes. Uh, I thought the first, uh, the first one is hard to beat. It's new. It's fresh. And to be honest with you, as I sit here right now, uh, I can't, where did I, I call, I think I call the other undertaker triple H matches, but I can't remember exactly where they were. I, I remember them. The end of an era match. I know you did for sure. Yeah. No, I, I, I like the match and knowing the backstory that it, it, again, afterthought is not a good term, but, uh, an 11th hour decision to put them on the show against each other, uh, was, uh, very admirable because let's be honest about it. These two guys have a wealth of pride. They're both big time over. They're both hall of fame guys, and they gotta be looking at this thing like, well. I guess we just barely made the cut. So we're going to go out there and kill the son of a bitch. We're going to kick ass. And I thought that's what they did. So I, I, I had no issues with that, with that match. It would have been better if we had a longer build to get there. You know, what a triple H and Undertaker both, uh, their fortes was building to something. Yeah. And they did have a long build for this matchup, but I enjoyed the match a lot and it would have been a shame. A damn shame if they had not been booked. So I can't even imagine it. It didn't even fact, it didn't even process for me. So, uh, but I think this first one was one that I remember the most good because it's far this WrestleMania 17 as far as Astrodome presentation. So, uh, I'll go with number one until I'm, until I go back and research it. Well, here we are. It's time for the main event, uh, for the world title. You've got the world champ, the rock defending against Steve Austin. First, we see one of the best videos hyping up a WrestleMania match ever. It's the Limp Biscuit My Way video. People still talk about that one to this day. Uh, previously, they wrestled Fred Durst. Is that his, that his name? The yeah. singer? Didn't Fred Durst? Did. How about that? Yeah, how about that? I, I'm big in pop culture. Yeah. You're, <laughs> you're huge in Japan, too. Big. Uh, uh, Big. The Rock and Steve Austin previously wrestled for the world title at WrestleMania 15 and at Backlash, both in 99. Austin won both of those. In the buildup for this match, Austin's then wife, Deborah, was ordered by Vince to be The Rock's manager, and that was quickly dropped. Uh, and during the match here at WrestleMania, neither you nor Paul ever mention it. Was Austin uncomfortable having Deborah in that position, or, or why was that scrapped? I think they both, I think Rock and Austin both were uncomfortable with it. Okay. It just seemed like it. Why are we now? Why are we doing this? You know, Deborah always made us a, a picture better because of her beauty. 
Oh yeah. She's a gorgeous Alabamian. Is that a word? Alabamian? Yeah. There's a few of those around here. I bet. And, uh, but her services in that role were not needed. I think, uh, rock and Austin just want to keep it serious and transact their business because neither of them were over, overly sure of how this thing was going to be received. Right. I had my ideas. You got the homegrown Texas product wrestling in his quote unquote home market. Just down the road. He grew up in Edna advertised in Victoria. He watched Houston, Paul Bosch television his entire life. We had told that story. It was like a homecoming for the champion or for the challenger. Uh, so who do you think they're going to cheer? It wasn't, that they were a- a- angry at, at rock. She got a Texas legend here. that's coming back and just drew the biggest house in Astrodome history over any event. And we're going to turn him heel. And I, as I used this, uh, uh, this analogy before to me, it was like, uh, making John Wayne, uh, in one of his war movies, a Nazi, it didn't work was never going to work. Anybody think, oh, I, well, we might've been able to get it over. We'd have done. No, you tell me what you would have done to get it over. And I'd love to know that. I just don't think it was possible. And I expressed myself until I was told to shut up on more than one occasion. We're going that way. Leave it alone. Okay. So it was, it, but there you got to do the commentary sensitively by what you're hearing and not make rock a heel. That was a key thing. Not making rock a heel. Right. And because we weren't sure we we didn't want to expose what our creator was going to be with Austin. Uh, we couldn't make Steve that force feed him as a baby face. Just let the thing evolve. Let it, let it go and play off the audience. What are they, what are they buying? And what are those two guys selling? Uh, so it was a, it was an interesting balance that we were walking. Uh, but the Denver thing was, it may have just been a deal where, you know, Vince wanted to get her on the show. I don't know, but it, it just was ill-timed and not knocking anything about Deborah. But if, if it had been a valet that had a lot of wrestling experience, that was a bump taker like Trish or Lita or that type thing, uh, then, okay, I get it. But the two guys were not for it. And all they had to do is rock had to raise his eyebrow and Austin had to look down at his shoes and Vince knew, well, we ain't doing that. Tell, tell me a little bit about your sit down interview with these guys on SmackDown. It happens on, I think March 20th and man, it's such a great promo where he's saying, you know, I don't just want to win this. I need to win this. I need it worse than anything else. It comes across as real. And, you know, oftentimes we, we look at wrestling and we say, okay, we know that's guy guy. We know that's funny. Ha ha. But now this, that was real. And that's what really hooks fans. And this was so well done. It felt like there was some legitimate professional animosity between the two, some real gamesmanship, uh, some real competition. Even if you know what wrestling is, you could still believe, man, these guys, they're not always on the same page. What do you remember about that shoot? Well, well, there was competition. The competition was to see who's the best in the business. Yeah. It wasn't competition as, as, as in a shoot you know, uh, or, or whatever it was competition is who's the top guy in the wrestling business. And I think that that's what both of them were striving to, to achieve. Uh, we had that, we did that interview. Obviously we knew what we we're going to talk about. So the subject matter, uh, and the direction we were going to take this interview in was well established. We had no rehearsal. We had no script, right? Uh, and I take a lot of pride in that because it was somewhat like my interview with Mick Foley back in the day. There was no script for that. There was no writers for that. Uh, so I, 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 I know we, we said we did, I think we did in a locker room or someplace, something like that. And, uh, and I think we did it once I, I want to say we did it one take and Austin stole the interview. Oh yeah. And because what you said is accurate, he believed everything he was saying in his own context, maybe not the context of the, the, the event, 
but the context of personal. He was going to go on a, a journey here that really none of us knew how it was going to uh, translate. I'd express myself about it or what the hell that's worth. Uh, but nonetheless, it's irrelevant. But so that's where we were. So we sat down, did the interview. It was all natural. It was two great talents talking and making their points. Uh, it was really, really good. If you go back and watch that, look at Austin's eyes. Mm. They're phenomenal. And look at rocks exp expressions on how he sold what Austin was saying with his facial expressions. It, it foreshadowed how great he was going to become on the big screen. Very expressive. He knew how to, he knew, he knew what he was doing, uh, in that respect, just out of natural instincts. So it's uh, one of my, my, I was very happy to be able to be involved in it <coughs> and, uh, excuse me. And I was also, uh, it could have been a lot of other guys did that interview. You know, we had other people, Michael Cole could have done it. Kevin Kelly could have done it. It just wouldn't have seemed as right as Jr. doing it. That means breaking my arm, patting myself on the back, <laughs> which will create more dirt. Cause all I'm doing here, Conrad, as you well know, just looking for my goddamn push. Oh, of course. You've been Brother needs a push. Morning. Oh, good Lord. Got to have a push. So, uh, so that's the deal. I, I didn't know it's going to come off as good as it did because, and the star of that was Steve sound bites and rocks facial expressions. And they both are equally impressive. So if you go back and watch this, check out that interview. I'm sure you can find it. Oh yeah. Uh, easily enough, but, uh, it was pretty sensational. The match goes 28 minutes and six seconds. It's quite a visual. Just the guys walk into the ring. Uh, it's a hot pace early. According to Meltzer, the vast majority of the crowd is cheering Austin. Of course, we're in his home state. Meltzer would say you couldn't hear any booze for Austin. Even when he did the full fledged heel turn, there were always some cheers for the rock, but the booze would quickly overwhelm the cheers. Austin undid the turnbuckle padding. Austin hit rock with the ring bell. Before all this happened, rock stumbled and fell down to grab the blade that Earl Hebner dropped on the ground for him. Very obvious as TV caught it all. Austin beat on him to open up the cup. You wonder how that happens. I mean, how, how can, how can that happen? Think about it. It's such a crucial part, a dramatic part of the match. You know, it's coming. Yeah. And, and we're shooting the goddamn mat. Yeah. God. Fr so frustrating. Anyway, go ahead. Is there any heat on like Kevin Dunn's crew for that afterwards? Uh, not that I remember. Uh, I, I don't remember being any, but uh, there might've been some minor, but it is sitting there. We should never gone there. This didn't make any sense. Not the color, how we presented the color. Right. Rock hits a stunner for a near fall and Vince McMahon comes out. Austin hits rock spine buster for a near fall and rock comes back with a spine buster and a people's elbow. But unbelievably, Mr. McMahon breaks up the pin. Rock comes after Vince and Austin gives him a rock bottom for a near fall. Then he uses a low blow. He being Austin pronouns, pal. And he holds the rock for McMahon to hit him with a chair. And even at this point, the crowd has refused to turn on Austin, even though the belief was the McMahon heel character was strong enough to turn him. They're not turning him this night. They traded more near falls, including the rock using the rock bottom and Austin using the stunner. Finally, McMahon gives Austin a chair to use, but the rock kicks out. Austin goes berserk with this chair and hits rock up and down his body more than a dozen times. And Austin and McMahon shake hands and drink beer. And, uh, that's it. That's the end of the match. Austin is still being cheered by the fans. And, uh, even after the rock finally recovers, he's being booed. So it's four and a half stars. Uh, it is the two biggest stars in the business. And if you count Mr. McMahon as the character, and I think you should probably the three biggest stars in the business at this point. Yep. And you saw how ferocious the pop was earlier, just when Linda stood up and to your point, that was less about Linda and more about how much they hated Mr. McMahon. So it did feel like, okay, maybe that'll work, but I think we've underestimated how badly people wanted to see Austin at WrestleMania since he missed the year prior. Uh, we're in his home state. He is the hottest star in the business. And you could argue, well, the rock was holding his own and no doubt, but on this particular night in front of this particular crowd, 
this is probably a misstep. I think when Austin lists his regrets in his career, walking out on the company and turning heel here at WrestleMania 17 are always at the top of the list. What do you remember about that night and the decision to turn him heel? Well, uh, again, we had Heyman and I had to navigate some tricky waters there. Yeah. He had to protect the rock, uh, and not acknowledge that he's getting booed out of the building, uh, for losing the title. Um, I just thought it was, a, I thought it was a knee jerk, uh, creator decision. It was change for change sake. And you know, my theory on that, I don't, I'm not, I'm not a big change for change sake guy, make changes that are necessary or that are creative or enhance others that help get more talent over by making certain creative changes. But, uh, I never was sold on it. And that was one of my biggest worries that would I be able to get able to get an emotional level to get this over? Because honestly, I didn't believe in it. And one of the reasons that I think I was always able to enhance Austin's TV persona was because, because I believe so strongly in the character, the man, uh, the persona, the image. And I, I really worked hard to sell, uh, what we were seeing. And I, I, I cheated a little bit because I kind of directed the, the heel angst to Mr. McMahon. Like he's the reason for this, what's going on here type deal. I had to, I compensated a little bit to have the, to, to amp up the juice that this match deserved, especially at the end. Uh, so, you know, I, and I, and Steve was, look, he finally agreed, you know, he should have called an audible hit Vince with the stunner and boom, we're good. He, he see, if he had hit Vince with the stunner after Vince's help, helping him win the, he was to show that he outsmarted the top heel. Right. And f- folks that loved his caginess, his creativity and, and but you know, that's not what the, that wasn't the play that was called. And so, but obviously it didn't work. And, you know, in a few weeks, we got Kurt Angle, the little cowboy hat on and him and Austin singing, singing songs. My, uh, yeah. So, you know, and did that work for stone cold? I don't think so. You know, it's funny because I understand the mentality. I mean, I think, uh, I think it was Michael Hayes told me once the key to being successful in wrestling back in the territory days was leave while you're on top. That way you've always got somewhere to come back to. And at the time I thought. I didn't make any sense. Why wouldn't you just ride it all the way out? And he was pointing out, well, because when you're on top, there's only one other place to go and that's down. But if you leave one territory uh, as a top guy, you'll go into another territory as a top guy and you can string that together longer. Whereas if you start to slip down the card, if you ever jump ship, that's where you were last. That's where you'll be here. That made sense to me. And I wonder, you know, how much of, we know that we're, we're probably at the peak of the company but we're probably starting to see a chink in the armor physically for Steve Austin, where he starts to wonder, Hey man, how much longer can I keep this pace up with, with this neck thing, with my, with my knees? I I don't know how much longer I can keep this pace. So I need to keep it as hot as I can. So I understand the thinking there, but in hindsight, he says that he wishes he would have called an audible in that match and just hit Vince with the stunner, but he, he was worried about getting stale. And seeing the reaction this night, I still think we were a long way from stale. What say uh, you, Jim? Oh, well, uh, miles away. It simply was a matter of getting another heel hot. That's not, that's not challenging. That's not, right. uh, uh, some mystery, uh, uh, formula. It's what, what you do. And, and, uh, I think he was just worrying about who the successor to the rock was going to be because th- think about this Conrad. They waited two years to put them back together. Right. They pronoun boy, they waited two years, but in the meantime, if Steve has still remained a baby face all that time, it would have been up to the company to create more heels that were hot and you get hot, you get uh, some steam on Austin and you get graphic, you get a little physical, uh, all of a sudden you got a reason for another match. And we had guys there that could have. Fill that bill, triple H Kurt angle, 
you know, there are others. Get them hot. They may not be the rock. And by the way, they wouldn't have been the rock, but neither would anybody else in the face of God's green earth. Thank you, Harley race. Uh, and, uh, but that's not how it went down. So, you know, it just, Hey, look, it felt wrong two days later in, in hopes of getting Steve some heat. Uh, he, he, he cut me in Oklahoma city on SmackDown, the taped edition of SmackDown on taped on Tuesday. He beat the shit out of me for real. I had knuckle knots all over. You look at this next time you see Austin with his fists, look at how size those goddamn knuckles. Yeah. I had indentions all over my fat little face because he was fired up, man. And I, I told him, I said, God, after we got through, I said, are you pissed at a payoff or did I do something wrong to you? What the hell were you thinking out there? Well, I got to look, look, got to make it look good kid. You know, it's live TV. I said, but it wasn't live TV, Steve. Yeah. It was on tape, but he was the same. He was, he was undecided, unsure. He was going, we were going to do all we could. And uh, that was the night that he instead of using a blade, he used a scaffold little medical thing. And, uh, that was the angriest. My little lovely little bride ever got at me for wrestling. I didn't tell her I was going to do it. And it was very graphic. So that was on the SmackDown the following week. And, uh, I was only there to do one thing, bleed, baby bleed. And, uh, it still didn't get him over. He got booed in Oklahoma city for a few minutes. People love the character. They loved what he stood for. They loved everything about him. He's tough. He was hell bent. He was unique. He was his own man. He was anti-establishment and they did not want to lose that person. And, uh, and through our creative, we helped facilitate them losing that person. It's, uh, it's a little regrettable that that this happened the way it did, because it does feel like while we addressed at the top of the show, this is probably peak WWF. It's not here again. And a lot of people point to what happened in the main event, specifically the heel turn as the reason why, if we just, you know, swap the title and Austin was the new champ, maybe it would have been a different story, but ratings are going to go down. Merchandise sales are obviously going to go down attendance and pay-per-view buy rates all going down. It's all been documented. And I think in hindsight, this was probably a pretty pivotal night in WWE history. We should also remind you that the rock is going to be given a suspension by Vince on TV so he can go film the Scorpion King and with the rock away, man, it feels like, I don't know what could have been, um, is this a top five, you know, you, everybody wishes they had a do over type moment. I think so. I think some may not admit it. Right. Uh, but yeah, I think it was, a. it was just a blown opportunity. And again, you think back to why and, and, and all, and all the evidence that in, in the, in your own case of saying we shouldn't have done this. Here's a proof. Here's a, here's a, here's a, evidence. One, your honor. Here's two. Here's another example. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, it just, it was a, it was ill time. You're losing the most charismatic guy arguably you've ever had in the rock going to make his movie, which was essential. It was imperative. And we were going to do, uh, everything we could to make sure that happened to help build rocket to a bigger star. But we also lost our top baby face. So we lost two of our top baby faces, one through and both of them really creatively one to make a movie and one to become a heel. Right. Think about that. It's just, it was not good strategy and planning again, in my estimation, and it came at a bad time. Well, let's put a bow on uh, WrestleMania 17. I mean, I know your answer thumbs way up. Yep. Where would you rank this though? In terms of your all time favorite WrestleManias that you were a part of? Well, memorably, uh, uh, the, from the memorable standpoint, Conrad, for how it affected our company that we talked about. You know, we, we, we booked ourselves into a corner that, uh, was hard to navigate out of, I still would, and it's so important how all these things came about the TLC match set a precedent. It created a new match. It created a new pay-per-view, uh, angle and Benoit. I love that match. 
I thought it was great. But the key thing about this show uh, was the turn for, for Steve and how it affected the rest of the roster. And I think it served to be a little bit confusing. Now, why is it again? I'm supposed to not like Austin, right? Why is it? He's a bad guy now, right? I wasn't ready for that type deal as the fan would say. And I think most of them felt that way, but it still would always be in my top three, maybe number one. Uh, I really enjoyed working with Heyman. Heyman had one of his better nights, quite frankly. And, uh, I thought we meshed well there. Uh, and of course, Heyman was the perfect guy to have out there because he could sing the praises of the new heel Austin. And, uh, and, and that helped Steve's case without doubt, without a doubt. So I'd say it was in the top three of my all time pay-per-views and maybe number one, I'd be hard pressed as I sit here right now, uh, in lovely Jacksonville beach, Florida to tell you that I called one that I like better and that it was, it was one of those deals for, for me, I, it was before we started splitting up the announced teams, I, I had, you know, I didn't share the, the two, two announced team thing which I always thought was in shits and egocentrically. It's easy to say, well, JR just wanted to call the whole show. He did. I did want to call the whole show. And when you call a match, you sit out, you call a match, you sit out, you lose rhythm, you lose timing, you lose momentum more importantly. So, uh, it was, a. I I liked it for that matter that, that Heyman and I called the whole show. Uh, but I, I, I really enjoyed the pay-per-view for the historic, effect that it had on the long-term WWE. We found we had just outbooked ourselves and we outbooked, we unbooked the two top baby faces that arguably the company had ever had. And maybe even to this very date, to this very date, nobody's there now that's even coming close to what Austin and rock meant to that company, in my opinion. I don't think there's any argument there. And I don't think there's any argument that we're having fun on grilling Jr. Jim, we didn't talk about this off the air, but this is our 100th episode together. So congratulations, buddy. We oh, made it to a hundred episodes. What a relationship. We're like the Siegfried and Roy of <laughs> podcasters. Silva's our tiger, right? Yeah. Our tiger. Yeah. Uh, well, Conrad, that's all been a pleasure. And I, I, as we were talking, I'll mention it one more time out of my massive ego needing stroked, uh, this as we, before we went on the air, we started recording. I saw our, our podcast was number one. Yep. And, 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 and I still, I'm going to, I'm proud of that. I'm proud that our audience sticks with us and they try us every week. Some shows are going to be better than others, but they're always going to have great effort. We think we bring some informative information forward, a uh, different perspective. Sometimes this show is more cerebral not as comedy oriented as we have been in the, in the past. It all depends on the topic. Uh, but I, I'm, uh, I'm very proud of our, that one other show. And I'm proud of the fact that people are watching and listening. So, uh, but working with you has been a pleasure and I hope we have a hundred more. Oh, I'm sure we will, but our next one is going to be a special one. We're covering mankind's 1996 and 1997. He debuted that character. He being Mick Foley pronouns, pal, uh, on April 1st, 1996, it was the day after WrestleMania. And he, let's just think about what an incredible character mankind was. He has this crazy mask and crazy gear and he's missing patches of hair and he's pulling out his own hair and his finisher as he sticks his fingers down somebody's mouth. And he has an entrance song and an exit song. It was just a phenomenal presentation. And of course we would see him main event, a pay-per-view later that year against Shawn Michaels in Philadelphia, but come 97, boy, his character really takes a turn. We see cactus Jack. We see dude love. We see the three faces of Foley. We see the big sit down interview series with you and you got goozled. It, there's a lot of great stuff that we're going to talk about next week and pay homage to one of the all-time greats, Mick Foley. And believe it or not, Jim, I have saved cactus Jack or Mick Foley as a topic across all my podcasts, this will be one of the first times we've done a deep dive on him as a performer, because I wanted to do it right. And I felt like you were probably the right guy to do it with. I'm pumped about next week. Yeah, me too. Thanks Conrad. Well, you know, Mick was a special case for me. He, 
he was one of the first guys, if not the first guy that I really had to lobby and sell to Vince. And the reason for that was that he had, Mick had been brought in just as a TV enhancement guy, getting a tryout. And he'd had like two or three tryouts in WWF, uh, at that point in time, two or three, it was more than one. <clears throat> and, uh, he didn't turn heads. I put it this way. He didn't turn the right head. Right. And so I think Vince kind of acquiesced to me being new in my role that he didn't want to take the air out of my sails, uh, where I would lose my edge to find talents and see talents. That maybe somebody else had not seen, uh, as far as potential, but Mick never, ever disappointed me or anybody else in WWE. We, we, we found a, a kind of a, a Rembrandt, except he just operated on a different kind of canvas. He was just, uh, amazing. And, uh, sometimes Mick was his own worst enemy. We'll talk about that because he cared too much sometimes. Uh, but he was, a, he's just an amazingly gifted performer. Uh, and you know, he's just, uh, every, everything he's, every honor accolade that he's gotten, he's earned. He didn't have the best body. He didn't have the best look. He, had, he was a great psychologist. Uh, you know, Dr. Britt Baker could probably give him an attaboy for that, uh, her mandible claw, you know, and that she used a version of what Mick used. Wouldn't you think? Oh yeah. So, uh, uh, classic guy. And as buddy Rogers once said, it couldn't happen to a nicer guy talking about himself <laughs> and it couldn't happen to a nicer guy with Mick, just a sweetheart of a person. And so, uh, hope he'll listen uh, next week. I got a kick out of him on, on TV. He was, he had heard about, it's funny how the WWE loyalties are always linger. He said, uh, I just heard about this match on Wednesday night with, the, uh, the, you know, Dr. Baker and, uh, Thunder Rosa. I want to, where, where do I find it? Oh man, Mick, come on. Bullshit. Where do I find it on a planet far, far away in the land of dirt and any window you'll find it. It's on TNT every Wednesday night, buddy. You know that, but. He might get booked. He's, he's looking to not kill a WrestleMania booking. <laughs> well, Foley's promoting a goddamn AEW. I'm not, he's not going to be at WrestleMania. He's not going to be at my WrestleMania. So, uh, at any event, it's going to be fun to talk about so many great memories, you know, him writing his books and, or the first book, which he wrote on a longhand on a pad, a notebook. Amazing. That was one of my first things. So I go to TV, Mick, let me see your transcript. Here it is, handwritten in cursive. And I would, he would sh share with me. So I think I was probably the first person uh, in the wrestling business outside his family, I'm assuming, right. that, that saw that, that manuscript as it was being developed. So uh, pretty damn good. I'm just surprised that somebody hasn't made a movie on his life to some, well, I, I got somehow. It's coming eventually. It's got to, right? Yeah, I think it has to. And what also has to happen is we're going to cover WrestleMania 27 in two weeks, right before this year's WrestleMania, you'll be able to hear us break down the WrestleMania from 10 years ago. Of course, famously that one happened in Atlanta. It was another version of, uh, the undertaker and triple H, but in the main event, it's the Miz and John Cena for the world title. The rock is the host and Jerry Lawler finally got his WrestleMania match against Michael Cole. Uh, we're going to talk about the good, the bad and the ugly. But I'll tell you what, there's nothing ugly about slathering a little sauce on your barbecue this weekend. Tell everybody where they can get the hookup, Jim. Sauce it, baby. Well, jrsbbq.com is uh, our little family website. Doing good. Doing good. Thanks to you guys. Uh, it's gr always grilling season, as you know, in my world. Your world, too, Conrad. <clears throat> I find out that I can just eat healthier. I'm not deep frying things. I'm not, you know, the grill is the way to go uh, when you can. And. Uh, we've got some, you know, my mama's recipe was the JR's original barbecue sauce. A lot of people really like the chipotle ketchup. I made a meatloaf here, meatloaf, uh, here recently with using chipotle ketchup. 
my, my go-to lately has been the, uh, I, I made some, I made some, uh, I, I bought some grilled asparagus from whole foods and I, I, I was cooking a burger in this pan that has these ridges that give you grill marks because you can't have a grill here in my condo. Bummer. If I buy another one. I'm gonna make sure I can, if that's possible. So, um, I, I, uh, but the, I use the, the all purpose seasoning to season my asparagus killer. Absolutely killed it. So we got some good products. We got regulars that, that buy from us on a, uh, you know, ongoing basis. Uh, we've always got specials. Uh, Stephen link runs that site. I pride myself and, uh, and we both pride ourselves because he, I've tried to put the fear of the good Lord in him that there's nothing more important to customer service. You know, it, we're going to make it right. So jrsbbq.com never closes, costs nothing to look. And so I hope you give it a shot. And, and, uh, I think we're good. I think we're getting, uh, I think we're getting a, a good uh, stash of under the black hat and paperback for our, on our site coming up. So uh, a lot of, and I got the, so you can get an autographed copy of under the black hat and, uh, and, and, uh, and hard, hard, hard cover. It's a fun little project. We thought it was going to be a fun little project. It's turned into a very uh, successful business because of you guys. So we, we thank you. I thank you for that. And, uh, and hopefully someday after I'm long gone, my kids will be thanking you as well. Well, I hope that's a long time from now, but I will tell you, it won't be long when you place your order until it arrives. You got to hook it up, especially that all purpose seasoning. That's my go-to it's jrsbbq.com. Don't forget. You can get all these shows like the one you're listening to right now, early and ad free over at adfreeshows.com. And later this week, if it hasn't happened already, uh, we're dropping the special alternate commentary on that WrestleMania three match between Steamboat and Savage. It'll be a good old JR and the voice of your childhood, Tony Schiavone, sort of reimagining what that might sound like. Next week, they'll tackle the ladder match from WrestleMania 10 between Sean and Razor. And in two weeks, we're going to be talking about WrestleMania 30 and the Undertaker streak coming to an end at the hand of Brock Lesnar. And uh, I think this is going to be fun, man. People are going to really dig this over at adfreeshows.com. I think so too. Good topics. Uh, very timely here at WrestleMania season. It's all good. So, uh, uh, life is good. Conrad, you know, if you're, it's a great time to be a wrestling fan. I agree. There's a lot of terrific product out there and, you know, I'm especially proud of what we're doing at AEW. You know, it's a different presentation. It's a, it's an alternative to what perhaps the fans have been used to, but they kind of see now our direction of what we're doing and. Uh, I think it's a, a very encouraging the ratings are still good. I know, uh, Turner's very happy with what we're doing. I see people that don't like to have the ratings posted. That's another amazing bitch. Why do you talk about the ratings all the time? That's how we make a living. You think the network's going to keep us on the air if, if our ratings are not good. So to document our successes, our failures is somewhat imperative as it, as it looks to the big picture. So, uh, I I'm really proud of what we're doing and we got some cool things. And I, from what I understand, you know, we're not that far away from making a decision about going back on the road and, uh, that'll be a different p piece of business. I'm kind of, I'm kind of have a mixed bag on that deal. I understand why I know it's going to be great and there's bigger crowds and enthusiastic, enthusiastic crowds. But to make that 25 minute drive go away, that's hard to beat for my commute. Yeah. It's going to be a little challenging, but, uh, I'm looking forward to it. So keep an eye on our schedule. The AEW schedule is looking very positive and, uh, a lot of, a lot of shows that were canceled because of COVID or had already had tickets on sale. Looks like are going to be, uh, reissued for lack of a better term, Conrad. And that's always fun. I just don't want to go to the Northeast and. I don't want to go to Rochester, New York in December. Well, you're going to Rochester, New York, but I think it's in September. Correct. Uh, so either way though, we're going to have fun this year. It's going to be nice for things to start to open up and be back to normal, but you can always count on us being your Thursday. Normal next week. It's going to be a barn burner, man. Our first profile on Mick Foley. We're going to break down mankind's 1996 and 1997 right here 
on Grilling JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. And, and get a new shirt. See this shirt here? Yeah, I like that shirt. Box of gimmicks.com. Come on, look at you, natural promoter. We'll see. Hey, you I I uh, I went on that site just the other day and was shocked of all the cool things. And that's I'm embarrassed to say that because I should have been on all along looking at it. And uh when we were taping that uh, epic piece, I told Bull Ramus, aka De Silva, that uh, I need some swag. I'll take care of you. And uh, just like that, when I got in within two or three days, I had little boxes of box of gimmick stuff and, and it's going to be cool as hell. I'm going to start wearing it on television. So, uh, all good, man. But box of gimmicks.com is look, it's nothing else. Just go check it out. It's like I said about my website, check it out and support the guys that are on the, on here. And you may find something that you really like the tumblers, those Yeti like tumblers home run home run baby. That's not even, it's not even a consideration. You got to buy yourself one of those, this coffee cup. Yep. That's a, that's a box of gimmicks coffee cup. Conrad, he's a box of gimmicks. He's a large box of gimmicks, <laughs> but he's a, he's, he's my large box of gimmicks by God. So it's all good, baby. All good. Life is good. I'm very blessed. You and I both are very blessed that our audience gives a damn. And sure. for that, for that respect. And that loyalty, we ain't going to let them down ever. No, That's sir. My, my promise. And by the way, heavy on the mister. We'll see you next week, everybody. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.